Hello, I'm Federico Magni, Senior SEO Specialist for 10 years with over 100 sites ranked on Google, and now founder of the SEO platform Get SEO Fix. This SEO guide will help you discover the basics of doing search engine optimization from the very beginning, understanding keywords, and choosing the right domain and the hosting. We will continue with the structural elements of an effective website, we will go through the writing of SEO-friendly content, and we will study various web page optimization techniques or on-page factors. Further on, we'll talk about the real stuff, like link building and results metrics by means of key performance indicators. After that, we will devote ourselves to an effective website analysis from an SEO perspective, and we will study the different SEO approaches for e-commerce, for blogs, for local businesses, and for YouTube videos. Finally, we will address the full topic of SEO penalties with their respective solutions in detail, particularly focusing on negative SEO, Google Sandbox, and Black Hat tactics. Let's start with two of my actual experiences that I've had in the field of SEO. This is a project developed in 2018. It is a book price comparison with 250,000 indexed pages and prices updated in real time, thanks to a few partnerships with some major Italian publishers. I've always considered that this website is a failure, until now. The figures are really ridiculous in terms of revenue, but it will probably improve in the coming months. This example depicts a negative experience, but the field of SEO also brings great satisfaction. In fact, you can see below a report of a website which I consider a huge success. It is a report on a shopping niche with a thousand index pages. The sales volume provided by this website went from $10,027.24 in June of 2018 to $32,908.90 in January of 2019, literally tripling sales after just one semester. The tricks and the optimization suggested in order to obtain a successful website will be explained within the next few chapters of this book. Unfortunately, we can never know all the infinite variables of a project, and that is why failure is sometimes a part of our work. And in my opinion, it should not be hidden, because it is precisely the failures that make us human and not artificial intelligence. Who am I? Don't worry, I will not tell you the whole story of my life, but only some salient aspects that will help us get a little familiar with each other as we prepare for this journey we will take together, side by side. I am Federico Magni, and I have been doing SEO every single day for the last 10 years. I specifically created and ranked around 100 sites, providing sales to Amazon, Google, eBay, and other big companies. I recently launched my new startup company in order to offer guides and tools for search engine optimization. It's called GetSEOFix.com, and it is an all-in-one platform characterized by SEO tools and training guides, which help improve the ranking of websites on Google. I don't like stereotyping, but if I had to label myself, I would call myself a digital entrepreneur, affiliate marketer, and SEO specialist, even if the professional path that I've followed up to now has been very particular. In 1995, I bought my first personal computer with Windows 95 and, being able to change the desktop background without reading a tutorial on a blog or watching a video tutorial on YouTube, it was a significant challenge at the time because there were not many who had the privilege of having an innovative 56 kilobyte connection back then. After having created my first websites as a hobby and after Google search engine was created, in the early 2000s, I started an SEO collaboration with a Dutch casino. After that, I worked on the ranking of an e-commerce website for a company in Milan in 2007. Being a student at the University of Milan, I continued the SEO activity with various projects, trying to experiment with new techniques until the creation of a real network in 2012, 
related to the pregnancy topic. It was the time when the sinking of Costa Concordia was all over the news. Soon after, a similar disaster happened for some of my projects, and I'll tell you exactly what happened. At the time, not having advanced marketing skills yet, I dedicated myself exclusively to traffic. The results achieved after nine months, having around 8,000 unique visitors daily from search engines and practically monopolizing the main SERPs, search engine result pages, of that particular sector, pregnancy, were maintained for several months. At first glance, this may seem like a success, but it wasn't really like that. Sometimes, my colleagues call me stubborn, but I prefer the word determined. If I see some potential, I throw myself in. That's exactly what I did on this occasion, too. Today, I often tell my clients a phrase like, you can't eat traffic, because I had to learn the hard way that before jumping into an SEO project, one must study the key words in order to verify the profitability in advance, maybe with a Google Ads campaign. The alternative is to work on the ranking for over nine months to achieve traffic goals, as in my case study of the pregnancy network, but without obtaining the right conversions and revenue for your business, which is, after all, the primary objective. In the following years, besides developing other websites with SEO in mind, I launched some SAAS, Software as a Service, on the US market in order to improve my web marketing skills. Recently, I also help students and companies to grow their business by acquiring customers through search engines. At this point, let's clarify straight away what we mean by SEO. And, by all means, let's find out if it still makes sense to practice this art today, given the fact that it has been talked about again and again for more than 10 years now. What is SEO exactly? Just flat out, SEO, search engine optimization, consists of a set of practices aimed to optimize one's website in order to improve its position within search results, and thus getting a greater number of visitors. These techniques make it easier to appear on Google search pages, SERPs, in increasingly higher positions and to become more visible to navigators. I don't want to seem trivial, but I know from experience that certain concepts need to be reiterated more than once, especially to beginners. Search engines offer spaces reserved for paid advertisements where, with pay-per-click or PPC campaigns, advertisers spend money to bring every single visitors on their company web pages. On the contrary, the organic search space presents a list of relevant results based on a specific keyword entered by the user and sorted according to an algorithm, which is constantly updated in order to offer the best solutions for those who are doing online research, responding to their needs. Therefore, in this summary preview, you should have already understood that there are two ways of finding a website on Google. The first way is the paid option, through PPC campaigns, and the second option is free, achievable through a series of practices which, together, stand for the so-called SEO. At this point, you're probably wondering, which one is the most convenient? As I was working on my first e-commerce back in 2007, I found myself saying, I want to do SEO because advertising costs too much. And it kind of made sense. In some cases, this may be true. And then it is really worth studying the opportunity of doing SEO on a website. But not always. When you find yourself in the situation of having to choose between PPC and SEO, you will surely bump into the fairly intuitive concept of return on investment, ROI. And then you will ask yourself, which way will I earn the most money considering the investment required? For example, if I spend $1,000 on advertising in a PPC campaign in order to get 1,000 users and I earn $1,200, it means I have a margin of $200. On the other hand, if I could position myself on the same searches with an SEO campaign and would get 1,000 users with a revenue of $1,200, I would have a margin of $1,200. Right? 
Well, no. Although at first glance the SEO looks like the simplest and most profitable way to go, we must consider that doing the optimization is not quite enough to get everything perfect forever. Because the algorithms change over the years, the competitors are born every day, and besides, there are many other variables that come into play. Therefore, we need continuous monitoring and also some actions. At this point, there are two options. I learn about SEO and take care of it myself on my own time, or I pay someone who already knows how to do it. Nothing new so far. So what changed in the present? Mobile-first indexing. Since March of 2018, Google has been using the mobile version of web pages for the indexing and ranking process. You should have received a notification about this from your Google Search Console account. Big G has focused a lot on this aspect. This means that you will have to pay close attention to the mobile version of your website in order to verify and confirm that the user experience of those who use smartphones or tablets is optimal. Website speed. Nowadays, the user experience is one of the most important ranking factors for Google, and certainly the opening speed of the web pages is an element that should not be underestimated. Without having to implement Google AMP technology, mobile page accelerators, particularly adopted by news websites, you can use a lightweight and optimized responsive template. GDPR. With the European legislation in force since May 25th of 2018, it is now mandatory to insert a detailed privacy statement, in addition to the various banners asking for consent to the acquisition of personal data. Vocal Search We are now seeing an exponential growth of vocal searches on Google. This involves an increased use of long-tail keywords, for example, where to go eat in Milan, which require a different content optimization compared to the past. Featured Snippets Often, within the search results, there are already some hints like tables or short sentences with a link to the source website. These previews offer great visibility to the website that contains them, and they will be increasingly used. Why is SEO still convenient? You should know that the average CPC, cost per click, also known as pay-per-click, or PPC, on Google Ads and Facebook Ads has increased exponentially in the last five years as there are more and more advertisers who compete in the auctions for gaining visibility. In my humble opinion, in the coming years, the competition in auctions will be increasingly fierce, thus not all businesses will be able to support PPC campaigns. Instead, they will have to look for other options, and in this case, SEO will be one of the main alternatives. Depending on your activity, here are some reasons for which you might want to consider using SEO. E-commerce. If you have an online store of any kind, you probably already know that in a pay-per-click campaign on Google Ads, you will pay for every single visitor you receive, even if, eventually, this visitor does not buy your product. This means that you will have to do a great job with your conversion rate optimization, CRO, in order to still have a good profit margin, considering advertising costs and taxes. Therefore, SEO could be a good way for you to go and you may be able to maintain a good margin, even if you are not a guru in conversion optimization. Lead generation. For example, if you are a consultant, such as a tax consultant, you may be interested in not spending 75 cents for each visitor coming from a PPC campaign. In this case, creating a blog with a series of web pages indexed on specific keywords could provide you with enough traffic in order to guarantee an interesting number of quote requests which could increase little by little, day by day. Branding. When someone searches for your company name on a search engine, it is essential to appear before anyone else, especially because those who have been looking for you are probably interested in buying your products, and evidently, they have already heard of your brand. Affiliate marketing. Personally, without SEO, I would have never succeeded in procuring sales from various e-commerce companies I've partnered with along the years. Practically, the high costs of PPC campaigns have been zeroed out with an SEO campaign. I could go on and on with other cases and examples in which SEO plays a key role, 
but I'm sure that the most illustrative way to explain the convenience of doing SEO is precisely the following slice of real life. In 2017, I had a colleague who was dedicated to software development in northern Italy. We are talking about a freelancer with a sole proprietorship. He basically promoted his work with a landing web page containing a contact form to request a quote, which was normally followed by a phone call to make the sale. Furthermore, it received traffic from a Google Ads pay-per-click campaign and spent around $350 a month. It always brings a smile to my face when I remember how he used to say, and again, I have to take out $350 from my pockets to pay Google. Let's talk a little bit about numbers. My colleague has spent over $4,000 annually from the beginning of the campaign, so most likely a total of $12,000 in these three years of activity. For a structured company, this amount is probably peanuts. But for an individual company, it certainly does not fall in the category of neglectable costs. What we can learn from this experience is that paid Google Ads have been a great advantage for my colleague in allowing him to find out which keywords are the best converters and therefore procure sales. On the other hand, one year after starting this campaign, it would have probably been appropriate to evaluate the possibility to complement or even replace the paid campaign with a good SEO ranking of its landing web page, precisely for the keywords identified with a paid campaign. This practice is considered an intervention that can provide considerable cost savings for an individual company and increase the number of conversions and, consequently, sales. In this particular case, doing SEO on the landing web page would provide excellent search results based on those keywords, thus offering better conversion rates, generating visits, conversions, and sales in automatic, without having to actually pay the bill to Google for advertising campaigns. I would like to point out to you that without having to pay Google the bill for advertising campaigns is not synonymous with free of charge. The optimization of a website is constant work, which will probably be less expensive than a pay-per-click campaign, although this is not true for all markets, but it still requires resources, like your time or the money to pay someone else to do it for you. How much does it cost and how much time does it take? Anyone who wants to do SEO can choose between these two different paths. They can either learn on their own by investing their time or they can choose to pay someone else to do it for them. In terms of time, the factors vary, depending on the market niche, the number of pages, and a few other variables. But ultimately, we can say that generally, or at least from my experience on the European market, some minimum results can be seen after three months from the first intervention and reaching the final goal occurs after 6 to 12 months. Listed below is an example of my new project on religion, which, with a few hours of initial optimization and zero backlinks, has started showing improvement in terms of traffic after the fourth month. In general, the intervention requires an important initial optimization work and periodic monitoring afterwards, on a weekly basis at least. The exact number of hours required depends on the complexity of the SEO project. According to ahrefs.com, if we speak of prices instead, we can choose between the following options. Monthly fee. Regardless of the actions performed or the number of hours dedicated to the work, a professional requires a monthly fee with a variable cost between $500 and $1,000, depending on the candidate. I would like to emphasize that an SEO agency requires higher quotas than a sole consultant. Hourly payment. Some professionals or SEO agencies require specific compensation for every hour worked, which is usually around $100 per hour. By outsourcing in Latin America or India, it might be possible to reduce the costs down to $60 an hour. The figures described above refer to the SEO market in the United States, which is considerably more competitive than the European one. Another significant impact on prices may come from the professional's experience, the type of SEO campaign, the competitiveness of the niche market, the number of keywords, and many other variables. It shouldn't be forgotten that Google integrates over 200 variables in its algorithm in order to sort the results as they appear in the search web pages. 
It is the duty of every good SEO specialist to consider and work on these factors. To give just a few examples, I mentioned the loading speed, the relevance of the title tag, the age of the domain, the quality of incoming backlinks, the extension of the domain, the social signals, the web page content length, and the performance of click-through rate. Fortunately, not all SEO factors have equal weight, but there are some that matter more than others, and this is why SEO interventions focus on just a few dozen variables. We can say that Google works on three fundamental principles, inspired by the 200 factors, in order to decide what should be shown first, second, and so on. Trust. How can a site be trusted? If a page has good content with links from other quality sites, it will obviously be easier to rank. Authority. In the past, the authority of a website was measured by page rank, which also took into account the popularity in terms of backlinks, but today, there are several factors that make a site authoritative and other metrics were born, such as the Moz domain authority. Relevance. It is essential to show users the most relevant content in order to answer their questions, and this is the reason why we talk about relevance. Having backlinks from web pages themed with the same topic certainly contributes in a positive manner. Personally, I love to focus on the last one, relevance, because in my experience, interventions of this type require less time than the other two, authority and trust, and they are more feasible, even when in particularly competitive markets. What has changed with RankBrain? If you are a beginner, I anticipate immediately that this section will be a little bit tricky for you, but I suggest you try to deal with it. In short, Google RankBrain is a constantly updated and improved machine learning algorithm used by Google since 2016 in order to sort the search results. Basically, in the past, Google algorithm was constantly optimized by programmers and human personnel through verification, feedback, and approval. Now, with the advent of RankBrain's artificial intelligence, the algorithm optimizes itself in complete autonomy, evaluating the public behavior based on the search results and adjusting the rules accordingly. RankBrain has two main objectives, understanding the keywords and measuring how people interact with the results, thus interpreting their satisfaction. Going straight to the core of things, nowadays, Google is able to interpret the search intent, including, for example, that where to sleep well in Milan has the same meaning as where you can sleep well in Milan. In the past, we often used the so-called keyword cannibalization, which means that we could create two distinct pages, each optimized for a keyword. Today, it is preferable to work on a single medium tail keyword, for example, sleeping in Milan, rather than on multiple long tail keywords, for example, where you sleep well in Milan, thus allowing for other keywords which present the same search intent to appear too. We have just seen that doing SEO at the time of rank brain actually forces us not to forget about the user experience and the user behavior because the algorithm is constantly influenced by these two. From a practical point of view, it is important to have a good click-through rate, CTR, on Google search pages and an adequate bounce rate because they are strong indicators regarding the user's interest in our web page. Just to give you an idea, you can have a good click-through rate, CTR, focusing on optimizing the title tag with a bit of copywriting, while for the bounce rate you need to make sure you have relevant content in terms of quality. Instead, in terms of graphics, it may be worthwhile to include internal links to other resources on your website. We'll see everything in detail in the next chapters, so you don't need to worry if this section seemed too technical. I like to see myself as a curious person, because I always see some learning potential everywhere. I think it is useful, but also interesting to know about the history of search engines in order to understand the evolution that we have seen in the last 30 years. As we speak of search engines, nowadays we think of Google, almost exclusively, but we must remember that there are several others, such as Bing, Yahoo, and so on, which certainly convey just a small traffic fraction compared to Big G, but they still fall within the definition of a search engine. On a technical level, a search engine has some fundamental characteristics. Crawler. 
The system automatically browses the World Wide Web by visiting a myriad of web pages and websites in order to find information and content. Indexing The web pages returned by the search results are being analyzed based on their titles and other metadata in order to be subsequently organized better for the purpose of being quickly consulted in the future. Information Retrieval A user enters a keyword in the search form and the engine returns the results ordered according to a specific algorithm. In 1990, the first search engine was Archie Query Form, which dealt with finding FTP websites in order to create an index of downloadable files. In 1994, the InfoSeq project seemed to be a real revolution as it allowed webmasters to send a page directly to the index. It was born the same year as the famous Yahoo Search. In 1996, besides the Alta Vista search engine, the Backrub appeared, thanks to the work of Larry Page and Sergey Brin. It was a sort of forerunner to Google, as it already used backlinks in its own algorithm. Finally, in 1998, the MSN search and Google search engines were launched. The latter released its first significant update, called Boston, in 2003, while in 2005 there was already the advent of no-follow links to fight the so-called spammy blogs. Various Google updates followed afterwards, such as Panda, Penguin, and Hummingbird, in order to fight the increasing spam. In 2009, MSN Search undertook a rebranding operation that gave birth to today's Bing, while in the following year, Google Instant was born with the aim of providing results in real time already while typing the keyword. In 2011, Schema.org was launched, which offered structured data to search engines. It is still used today for previews of cooking web pages and product reviews, through the famous Rich Snippets as an example. In 2015, RankBrain was released, an update that included the machine learning within the results ranking process. In 2017, Google began to punish the websites which contained pop-ups and similar that damaged browsing. Subsequently, the Fred update was also released, with the aim of penalizing those sites that favored monetization over the user experience. Finally, we cannot forget the widespread dissemination of vocal searches in 2019, thanks to some devices such as Google Home and Amazon Echo, which have become more and more mass products. Whether we like it or not, since the 90s onwards, keywords have been the fulcrum of search engines. But what exactly is a keyword? A keyword is either a sentence or a single word that, once inserted in a search engine, returns a series of relevant results. The website's optimization usually occurs based on one or several keywords, which are previously defined, while also taking into account the fact that not all keywords are equally effective, because we should be able to identify those that generate greater sales for our business. Further on in this chapter, I will explain the various types of keywords and how it is possible to generate a list of keywords through various SEO tools. We will then discover how keywords should be evaluated, how it is possible to spy on our competitors, and we will then conclude by talking about voice search and advanced keyword optimization tactics. Types of Keywords it may seem obvious, but keywords are not all the same. Personally, I love distinguishing keywords based on their commercial intent. Informational. The user is looking for information on a specific topic. For example, how a smartphone works. Navigational. The user wants to access a specific site. For example, Media World Login. Transactional. The user wants to buy something. For example, Buy cheap smartphone. I would like to point out that in the case of an e-commerce, you could actually obtain great results by using not only transactional or navigational keywords, but also informational keywords throughout. For example, by creating specific articles of an internal blog to answer the questions of the public and then propose links to the sale pages of the products mentioned within these articles. Then, we can distinguish other types of keywords based on the length of the phrase or based on its semantics. A short tail keyword. Keyword up to three letters in length. For example, SEO. Medium tail keyword. A keyword consisting of two to three words. For example, 
Prof SEO Tools Longtail Keyword Keyword longer than three words. For example, SEO Tools for Beginners. Geotargeting Keyword A keyword that refers to a city, a region, or a specific state. For example, sleeping in Milan. An LSI Keyword Latent Semantic Indexing Keyword A keyword that has a thematic relevance with the main keyword. For example, pizza and pizzeria. The choice of a certain type of keyword rather than another varies according to the market niche and to the optimization type. I would like to reiterate the importance of choosing the right keywords. In recent years, I have created various websites, such as the project below, which, with 30 daily visitors per month in January 2019, brought $858.21 in sales, unlike other sites, which are actually struggling to convert with over 500 daily unique visitors. How to generate keywords. If you are thinking of using keywords for your next SEO campaign, you should know that short tail keywords certainly have the advantage of being more public. But, as I said before in this book, you can't eat traffic. Consequently, for query terms that have large volumes of users, you have to consider that there will be more competition, making it very difficult to reach a good ranking in these SERPs. My advice is to generate a list of keywords, between long and medium tail, and then carefully choose the most suitable ones for your market. In order to generate this list of keywords, you can use the Google Keyword Planner tool, which also shows the ranges of monthly search volumes, even with seasonal distribution. Another very useful Google service for keyword research is Google Trends, which shows the keywords of the moment, their geographical distribution, and the growth or decrease in interest over the previous months or years. The limit of these services offered by Google is that they are offered by Google. Now let me explain a little better. I firmly believe, and this is my personal opinion, that I could have a competitive advantage over competitors if I could base my decisions on non-public sources, or at least not as famous as the classic Google service. Precisely for this reason, it is worth using other keyword generators or extracting data from the Google source, but in an unconventional way, like the method I have been using for a few years now, and that I explain in detail on www.getseofix.com slash keywords dash competitors. In order to show you the importance of the keywords, here is an example of the remarkable improvement of my site, obtained in 45 days after adding various LSI keywords in the pages without any other SEO activities. You can notice a sudden improvement in the ranking as the graph curve suggests. In detail, the pages of this website have suddenly positioned themselves in the top three on Google for six new keywords, in the top 10 on the front page for another 79 keywords, and in the first pages for over 400 keywords. Keywords is evolution. Very well. At this point, you have generated your list of relevant keywords, but you should have realized by now that not all of these keywords make sense for your project, and you actually have to delete some of them. One of the most common questions I get from my students is, how do you choose one keyword rather than another? I generally use the following criteria to evaluate keywords. Search volume. If you have thought of a specific word or, if maybe you found it elsewhere, you can always use the Google Keyword Tool to check its monthly search frequency. The search frequency is important in the sense that it is not convenient to push a keyword of 10 monthly searches with high competitiveness up on the ranking levels, but surely it would make more sense to push onto one keyword of 1,000 monthly searches with average competitiveness. Perhaps you're wondering how we can define the keyword difficulty. Let's see it right away. Competitiveness. I often read on blogs that a good method to estimate competitiveness involves entering the keyword on Google in order to see the number of results returned. If, for example, Buy Smartphone has 35 million results and Buy Oleander has only 64,000 results, can we conclude that the second one is less competitive than the first? Well, not always. Remember that you want to appear on the front page and maybe in the top three. Even if there were only 100 competitors in SERP, but all dragons, you would still have a hard time and the competitiveness would be very high. So, what should you do? 
The only solution would be to manually study the top 20 results, at least, and perhaps studying also the metrics, like the domain age, the page authority, DA, and trust flow, TF. For example, I would consider an SERP in which the top 10 have TF greater than 30 and DA greater than 40 as a competitive one. After having estimated the metrics, I would also evaluate the content in order to see if I could write a more informative and significantly better article than any other competitors. In the case that the metrics were really prohibitive and the contents were of the highest quality, then you would surely have a hard time and it would be very difficult for you to overcome your competitors, but not impossible. Relevance. Regardless of the volume of the research and the competitiveness, I often insert certain keywords into the content that seem particularly relevant to me or related to the topic that is being discussed. Considering these criteria, you should always keep in mind the final goal. As certain keywords might seem to be absolutely prohibitive in the first instance, they could actually have some use, if used as anchor text in internal links, for example. In 2019, we witnessed the spread of voice assistants like Google Home and Amazon Echo. I participated in the Alexa Skills program for Amazon as a developer, and I must say that a thousand users have already interacted with my interface, even though it is not yet clear how this business will evolve and we just have to wait for further developments. Only one thing is certain. The future will have an audio component in our lives, especially thanks to these virtual assistants that are now being integrated in our cars, homes, and smartphones. Talking about SEO, the big difference is that vocal searches are not short, but they are of the long tail type or conversational. Now, let's take a few examples about the difference between desktop and vocal searches. While in front of a PC, the average user looks for best pizzeria in Milan. With a voice search, people would say, which pizzeria is open now? We immediately note that the voice search is oriented to the use of questions. Who, what, where, when, why? With a local intent. Milan or omitting the city taking for granted the geolocation of the smartphone and with a conversation style compared to the old robot command. In order to take advantage of voice searches, you can follow these three steps. Mobile site optimization. Considering that virtual assistants are often used when you are not at home, the most common device is the smartphone, and therefore, obviously, your site must be well accessible on this type of interface. Google My Business. Make sure you have a business listing on Google, optimized for local searches, otherwise it will not be considered as a valid result for the answers of virtual assistants. Schema.org. By using structured data, your pages could be returned as an instant result to the users, but we will talk more about that later. It's no secret that espionage has always been a very hot topic, especially when it comes to SEO, and there would be so much to say around it. First of all, Studying what others are doing in their strategy is not wrong or negative per se, but it may have legal consequences in the cases of content plagiarism or unauthorized access to other people's servers. As long as you do things the right way and you limit yourself to studying the competition without being too invasive, in my opinion, it is perfectly lawful and even mandatory to do it, especially if you want to operate in particularly competitive niches. From an SEO point of view, you can find out which keywords are being used by your competitors, and this can be a great deal of help because by doing so, you can take advantage of their experience, especially if you have just entered a new market niche. Consider that those who are already in the top 5 of an SERP surely have some element that the Big G algorithm liked, and if you could replicate it on your site, you could get similar positions. But how can we actually find out what are the key words used on a competitor's web page? Well, you could read each competitor's article individually and isolate the most important keywords, but this would take a lot of time and it would not be very practical. The alternative is to use an SEO tool that I have developed specifically for this purpose. You can find it on www. 
getseofix.com slash keywords dash competitors, and you only need to enter the link to each of your competitors' web pages in order to start using it. This way, you will be able to see all of the keywords used on your competitor's web page within a matter of seconds, including the respective number of repetitions and the frequency of their appearances. Being creative and using these keywords in very different areas can help you improve the relevance of your web page. For example, title tag and meta description, headings, web page URL, article content, navigation menus, Anchor text in internal links, external links, or incoming backlinks. Discovering these keywords can also be useful from an SEM, search engine marketing, perspective, because they can also be used in the text of advertisements or in a campaign setting to define the target audience. Advanced Keyword Optimization As you may have guessed, this section is dedicated to those attempts, more or less vain, of advanced optimizations, with particular reference to the keywords. This section is mostly dedicated to the experts within the market because these concepts are needed to face particularly competitive SERPs. In fact, in these cases, you need to access a higher level of knowledge in SEO. I don't know if that's your case, but in my educational research, when I find something valuable, I always try to reciprocate in some way. For example, by putting a like, writing a comment, or making a gesture to thank the author. Speaking of advanced optimizations, I would like to focus on TF-IDF, Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency, which is nothing more than a formula which allows the relevance evaluation of a word in a document with respect to other similar documents. Put simply, the TF measures how many times a term appears in the document, while the IDF measures the importance of the term. For example, in a text, the conjunctions, that, and, etc., and the articles, the, a, etc., appear many times, but their weight is much less than other key words in terms of relevance. This formula has appeared in some Google patents in the past, and today it seems to be no longer used, because we have focused on LSI keywords with semantics that we discussed earlier. At this point, you must be wondering why I'm talking to you about information retrieval mechanisms, and the question is more than legitimate. Now, I would like to introduce you to a much more technical SEO world, with mathematical formulas and technicalities, compared to what is proposed in the various blogs. Until the arrival of the Hummingbird update in 2013, many SEOs applied the so-called keyword stuffing, meaning that they inserted the main keywords in various parts of the document, even in an unnatural way, in order to obtain a keyword density of 4 to 10%, thus increasing the relevance of the content. Unlike the concept of keyword stuffing, we now talk about keyword prominence and keyword proximity. The keyword prominence is the practice of inserting the most important keywords at the beginning of the title tag, meta description, H1 and H2, while the keyword proximity represents how close the single words of a search query are compared to other elements within the text. For example, reading the keyword wall fan. High proximity. The wall fan is ideal in the summer. Low proximity. It seems useful to have a fan to cool all the walls of the house. These practices today are not only less effective compared to the past, but they can also lead to penalties and loss of ranking in the SERP's positioning. Want to know what I think of all these strategies? As with many other practices in the SEO world, I believe that excess is always detrimental, while applying common sense can better lead to benefits, and it's precisely why I personally still apply some of these methods today, even if I do it in a softer manner. After having registered more than 150 domains in the last 10 years, I can say that I found myself in front of big decisions, having to make important choices before the start of each and every project. There were situations where I asked myself after six months if it would have been better to use another domain, but now I have a set of criteria that I use every time in order to avoid biting my nails when it is too late. How to choose the domain extension. Not everyone knows that in the 70s already, the Internet Protocol or IP addressing system was used. 
However, it soon became clear that it was not easy to remember all those numbers, and this problem became even more obvious with the advent of email. Precisely for this reason, in 1984, the domain name system was born, which is a system that allows you to avoid using IP addresses by using a readable name that automatically resolves the numerical value. Since that day onward, this system has been a huge success, and today we have over 20 million registered domains. Just to give an example, instead of connecting to port 443 of 178.32.136.223, Simply visit the getseofix.com address, which, among other things, is easier to remember. ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, defines various types of top-level domains or extensions. CCTLD, top-level domain country code. National extensions such as .us, .de, .fr, and for Italy, .it. GTLD. Generic top-level domains. These are the most famous extensions like .com, .net, and .info. Let's get to the bottom of the question. Which extension should be chosen for SEO purposes in order to be pushed in the SERPs? Rule number one. Country. Who is the site aimed at? If you have an exclusively Italian public, then I would use a .it. If it is French, a .fr. Instead, if it is international, I would use a .com. Rule number two. If you don't have a brand, consider an exact match domain. For example, if you deal with recycled paper, try registering recycledpaper.com. If, instead, your company is called Get SEO Fix and you deal with SEO tools, then you can register getseofix.com and optimize for the keyword SEO tools, even if this keyword is not included in the domain name. Rule number three, pay attention to the trademarks of others. Do a research on EUIPO and USPTO's trademark database in order to verify that your domain does not contain the names of other people's brands. Otherwise, it may be deallocated or you could be subjected to a lawsuit promoted by the interested party. And what if the domain is already taken? More and more people are registering domains every year, and obviously we are heading towards saturation given the fact that our vocabulary is not infinite. Precisely for this reason, it is increasingly common to find that someone else is using a domain that we would like to use, and perhaps they're willing to sell it for several thousand dollars without any apparently valid reason. This is a very common situation, but fortunately we have countermeasures available in order to deal with such situations. 1. Use the hyphen. For example, getseofix.com will become get-seofix.com, but always be careful not to infringe the brands of others. 2. Change extension. If the .com is taken, try .net or .org. 3. Finally, consider adding 24, info, or other short terms. For example, getseofix.com will become getseofix24.com. I created a special tool on www.getseofix.com slash domain dash search in order to verify instantly if the domain you are interested in is available for registration. You'll also find some alternatives and a helpful tool in order to proceed with a purchase at the best registrar. When you register a domain, you are obviously responsible for it and you accept a contract by which you become the owner. Your personal data, including email address, Telephone number, name, surname, and residential address will be sent to the registrar company, and even if data will not be entirely public, it will definitely be stored. Remember that upon the expiration date of the domain, despite the various reminders that the hosting company will send you, if you forget to proceed with a renewal, you could risk losing it, as someone else can legally register it and thus use it indefinitely. After placing the order, you will have to wait a few hours for the DNS propagation, after which the domain will be officially registered and it will become accessible to the public. Finally, despite the great marketing behind the new extensions .club, .uno, .online, etc., in my opinion these are just a hype, and unless you are launching a particularly social project or you have a specific idea, I don't recommend using these, especially if you plan to do SEO campaigns. EMD Update. Was it really effective? 
Not everyone knows that at the end of 2012, Google released the EMD, Exact Match Domain, update. Before that, owning a domain containing a specific keyword provided a considerable competitive advantage within the end result of appearing in excellent positions for a given online search without too many SEO interventions. I have several examples of my sites which, at the time, with only five pages of content got even 400 visits per day after just a few months of life. It was actually an unfair advantage and very abused by the various marketers at the time who managed to rank for interesting terms while using sites with little content. The situation has now changed. Although there is, in my opinion, a minimum advantage in the use of EMD domains, today it is increasingly difficult to find available ones because among investors, agencies, and domainers, the number of domains available for registration has now been considerably reduced. For example, for the SERP of glass bottles, the glassbottle.com site has a competitive advantage over its naturalis.com competitor. Obviously, many other factors that can invalidate this small advantage come into play, which is why, nowadays, many companies aim to do SEO with their own brand, without thinking about the use of keywords in the website's domain. It will seem obvious, but the .com domains have a specific deadline, and if they are not renewed, they will face a grace period. After the deadline, the owner has a few days to renew the domain without additional costs. A redemption period. Once the grace period has ended, the domain can still be recovered by the owner through the registrar itself by paying an additional fee. And pending delete. For a few days, the domain will be unavailable and non-recoverable. After this period, it will become available for registration again. There may be various reasons why important domains have expired. When a company realizes that it's about to lose its domain, it certainly does not idly sit by. In fact, there are specialized backorder services which, through the dedicated API providers such as GoDaddy, allow the registration in just a matter of seconds, as soon as the domain becomes available. Therefore, Real scripts fights are created in order to grab the domain a fraction of a second before the other competitor. But why all this interest in an empty domain? The history. In the course of its existence, a domain may have attracted very important backlinks, perhaps from newspapers, government sites, or authoritative magazines. Some SEO specialists make particular use of expired and deleted domains, checking the past history and whether the current reputation is still positive by evaluating backlinks and screenshots through services like ahrefs.com or archive.org. For example, if I was to deal with birth control pills, I might register the expired domain birthcontrolpills.com, but if it turns out that it has backlinks from sites of cheap coats and screenshots show a clothing e-commerce, obviously it would not be the best solution because it would be a bad choice in terms of SEO. On the other hand, if the recovered site was perfectly themed with a new project to be launched, personally, I wouldn't see anything wrong with this route. Then, there are other black hat SEO methods to exploit expired domains, but we'll talk about this later in a dedicated section. Change the name of a domain. Even if you were never married, you know that after marriage you never go back. Nowadays you can get divorced quite easily, but only as a last solution, with the respective costs and pains that you will have to go through. Similarly, the domain choice should be something definitive, which can certainly change but at a very prohibitive cost. Remember that the domain name you choose today will remain forever unless you make a transfer with all the SEO risks entailed by this action. Consider that you might regret a too hasty choice. Until now, I have always avoided changing the domain. I had to do it only once for branding purposes and it was pretty rough. In my case, I immediately lost 30% in terms of traffic, but I also read about companies that had to face losses of up to 80%. It is surely true that after a few months, things tend to go back to normal, but meanwhile we find ourselves suffering a decrease in terms of visitors for a more or less indefinite period. In business, 
this is neither positive nor tolerable. Consider that besides purchasing the new domain, you will need to keep the old one for at least 12 months. The whole procedure is based on the concept of redirecting all the pages of the old domain to the new pages of the new property, possibly with a one-to-one -one match, so that the search engine is able to recognize the old contents already indexed and replace them with new ones. You will have to make sure you find and redirect the old content towards an identical or equivalent web page in the new website. After moving the content to the new website, remember to verify the ownership of the new domain in the Search Console account and use the Change Address tool. This way, according to Google's Matt Cuts, the search engine should maintain, at least in theory, the same authority and the same ranking positions of the past, and the timing varies based on the number of indexed pages and many other factors. In short, after this overview, you will have realized that changing domain is certainly a feasible operation, and there are various guides to do it. But personally, I think it should be considered as the last solution, because the risk of losing traffic and ranking positions is really too high. Keep in mind that having a domain is not enough because you also have to buy the space onto which you will upload the website's files. This service is called hosting, and generally it is possible to buy at the same time within the same purchase order of the domain. If you need to have a registrar, the company that allows you to register the domain, and separate hosting, you will need to use DNS management in order to point the server's name towards your server's address. In this section, you will find out about the various types of servers that can be rented, the famous question of using HTTPs, the importance of IP addresses, and the consequences of using reverse proxies in an SEO campaign. Server Types and Performance We know that there is a lot of speculation behind each and every service on the World Wide Web. This is precisely the case with server selection. If the various servers look the same to an inexperienced eye who only notices the differences in terms of price, in reality, there is actually a gulf between one solution and another. Not being a system administrator, it took me some time to learn something about the server world and, still today, I feel grateful to the people who have had the patience to help me choose new hosts for my sites in the past. My suggestion for clients these days is to base their choice regarding hosting on these elements. Application type if it is an application or some script that uses Java, you will probably have to purchase hosting with particular resources and libraries available. If you just use WordPress, then you could opt for a standard solution with Linux hosting. Uptime guarantees. If you have a website, your first concern is that it is always accessible. Otherwise, some of your audience will not be able to visit, so they will leave. Hosting panel. I strongly advise you to buy hosting that offers cPanel or Plesk as control panels because they are safe, simple, easy to use, and they all have the functions that a classic WordPress website might need, such as cron job, antivirus, automatic backups, and much more. Dedicated hardware. I refer to available disk space and bandwidth. Look for hosts that have SSD hard drives because they are very fast and also check how many gigabytes they offer you. I recommend at least 10 gigabytes. If you have a lot of images, videos, or other heavy content, you should carefully evaluate the disk size you will be needing. Bandwidth. It all depends on how much traffic you will have and how big the files of your site are. Generally, 100 gigabytes of monthly traffic are enough for a small blog. Depending on the application type, you will also need to consider RAM and CPU in order to maintain high performance. SSL or TLS certificate Lately, many hosting services include Let's Encrypt free SSL certificate in order to provide greater security while browsing the website thanks to the HTTPS protocol instead of the classic HTTP. Automatic backups The periodic backup saves a copy of all the files, databases, and other website settings. Some hosting automatically backs up your website at regular intervals, so that, in case of malfunctions or hacker attacks, you just contact the support, 
and everything will be restored for free and exactly to the state in which it had appeared a few days before. Not all hosting is the same. We can generally make three distinctions. Shared hosting. This is the ideal choice to start a new project. Shared hosting is simply a server used by dozens of different customers. The big advantage is the cheap price. The monthly fee can be around $5 or less. The disadvantage is that, pretty often, you don't have dedicated resources and, in peak moments generated by other sites, your site will suffer in terms of available resources to let your users navigate. Server managers have various systems to resolve these situations through load balancing limits for each website. VPS or Virtual Private Server This is the ideal choice for sites with traffic. In a nutshell, it is a virtual machine mounted on a dedicated server. With this configuration, only a few customers use the same server. Another great advantage is having dedicated resources, such as RAM or CPU, that no other neighbor can occupy at peak times. The price, between $10 and $20 a month, is certainly higher than the price of shared hosting, and it varies according to the configuration. In order to manage a VPS, it's either necessary to have technical skills or purchasing a management service package. Dedicated Server this is the ideal choice for high traffic and professional websites. The big advantage is the possibility of having a dedicated IP. With the dedicated server option, you can have an entire server for yourself without having to share it with anyone else. The prices are very high, starting from $40 per month. But thanks to this server, you can manage huge traffic loads and also you can offer high speed to your audience. In this case, Server management skills are indispensable. My students ask me what I use to host my domains, and I must say that over the years, I've really tried it all. I started with a simple shared Italian hosting in early 2000, when the LAR, Letter of Responsibility Assumption of the NIC was still in place, for the registration of a new domain in Italy. After that, I switched to external shared hosting, which hosted dozens of domains. However, I soon realized that I needed something more powerful, so I switched to VPS. Not knowing at the time how to define the load, I noticed that even with VPS the performance was affected, and, as search engine bots were passing to crawl the site, the servers suffered from it. I then switched to dedicated servers, and I'm still into it today, because I believe they are the optimal solution for those who want to take business seriously. Besides having a customized configuration of firewalls and resources, a dedicated server also provides maximum freedom over everything and, with some Linux expertise, you can really do great things, especially from the point of view of security. I must say that in 2011, as I was moving from shared hosting to a dedicated server, I managed to bring an Italian website in the law market from 70 daily visits to around 2,000 visits without actually making any new changes. It is most likely that the shared hosting couldn't support all those visits, or there was a problem of IP address neighborhood, which we will discuss later on. In light of this fortunate discovery, I will never cease to remind my students how fundamental it is to realize when your server is down, or otherwise, when it fails to serve all the requests. Because due to these problems, we're losing visitors, and consequently, we're losing money. Precisely for this reason, I created a service on getseofix.com slash uptime dash monitor, which constantly checks your website and alerts you with an email as soon as it does not respond correctly, if it presents a response code of error, in order to allow you to promptly take action. In my experience, these problems occurred for two reasons. Hosting. As I mentioned above, hosting did not support the load of visitors, and neither did it warn me about this issue. Human errors. I happened to forget to renew the server contract, so I had various domains down for a few days until, only by pure chance, I noticed it. Due to situations like these, all my sites on Google were unfortunately de indexed. Luckily, however, after the renewal, they were re indexed almost immediately, and consequently, I didn't lose any rankings, but I earned $0 during those days, obviously. 
It also happens to have a plugin not properly configured, which generates a 503 or 404 error and makes the entire website inaccessible. HTTPs, do's and don'ts. As you may have noticed in recent years, there has been a massive marketing campaign concerning the fact that HTTPS is now an SEO factor and everyone must follow it. In short, when I hear these dogmas, I usually want to see it clearly. I anticipate right away that I haven't switched any of my websites to HTTPS and I only use it for new projects. Let me explain. What Google recommends is the most common sense. If I have an e-commerce site, which in addition to personal data, also collects credit card data, it would be a good idea to use a communication encryption system, in addition to being PCI compliant, in order to avoid, for example, the classic man-in-the-middle attacks. If I have a blog, in which there are no registration forms, why should I force the encryption of the connection to pass public data? Remember that encryption requires some milliseconds, and it is certainly slower than a clear data transfer, thus worsening the user experience, even if imperceptibly. Precisely for this reason, I believe that there has been a lot of speculation on the manner, and, apart from e-commerce websites or other websites that require to film forms, I don't see any good reason to forcing the use of HTTPS, especially for SEO purposes. Another misunderstanding which I often read about is the confusion over the terms. Often, we talk about SSL, but the HTTPS connection uses a TLS, Transport Layer Security, since 2008, and not the old SSL, Secure Sockets Layer, which had been used back in 1995. HTTP is a protocol that deals with navigation mechanisms, while TLS is an encryption protocol which verifies the identity of the server by using a certificate. Depending on your budget, you can buy a classic DV, Domain Validation Certificate, for a couple of dollars per year, or you could choose an Extended Validation EV Certificate, which, after some paperwork, will allow your site to have the famous green bar in the address bar of the browser. In the latter case, the annual cost reaches about $100, but for a company, it could procure some advantages in terms of trust and security perceived by the user. One of the main reasons why I use a dedicated server today is the possibility of having one or more dedicated IP addresses. If I have to create a project for the Finnish market, I tend to register a .fi domain and point my hosting to an IP address within Finland. Back in the days when I was still working on share hosting, unfortunately the same IP address was assigned to more customers, and each customer had dozens of websites. What was the result of that situation? It used to happen, and still happens today, that a website has the same IP as 50 other sites, or it is in the same C class. For example, the IP 5.45.78.2 has the same C class 78 as 5.45.78.18. In order to save on infrastructure costs, hosting companies often decide to host hundreds of customers within the same C class block, called an IP neighborhood, having even 10,000 sites on extremely close IP addresses. But what if one of these 50 or 10,000 websites is a spam portal, contains illegal content, or does something bad? In my opinion, and considering the experience described in the previous chapter, being in this situation certainly does not bring any advantages from the SEO perspective, especially if we think in terms of authority, trust, and relevance. The alternative is to check the IP in the so-called blacklists in order to make sure it is a clean IP. This condition should be checked pretty often and therefore, I have created a special tool for this on getseofix.com tools. This does not mean that all sites on shared hosting are penalized, but, in my opinion, there is a risk which a serious business should not take, even if it is only a potential risk. I don't want to get into technicalities, but we need to know that a reverse proxy is a sort of network interface interposed between the user and the recipient server. 
The most famous service is Cloudflare.com, which, except for some limitations, is free. By using this mechanism, the server's IP address is not directly visible externally, and this provides some advantages. Security. The interface already contains a firewall that blocks malicious requests and mitigates DDoS, distributed denial of service, attacks. Load balancing. The traffic load can be distributed to multiple internal servers in order to optimize performance. Caching. An intermediate server immediately provides some recurring answers without having to continuously contact the main server. But what does this all mean exactly from an SEO perspective? Surely the performance is facilitated and therefore the user experience is automatically improved, but at what cost? Instead of showing our IP address externally to the public and to search engines, the reverse proxy service is shown. We need to be confident that it's clean from all those effects of an IP address neighborhood, which we talked about earlier. During these years, I have tested these servers several times, and I have never had any problems. Lately, however, I tend to avoid them, because, having dedicated servers, I prefer to do a private configuration, without the risk of being penalized by an IP address that is out of my control, as it happens with the most part of reverse proxy services. With the advent of RankBrain, it's machine learning that's working on the algorithm now. Offering an excellent user experience, UX, is definitely important for SEO purposes also. Don't forget that search engines want to offer the best results to your audience, and if these people are not satisfied with the experience, they will certainly not come back, and this will put the search engine business down. Precisely for this reason, Google, Bing, and all the other search engines do their best in order to satisfy their visitors, and therefore, the user experience has become one of their most important goals to pursue. Simply, we can say that UX is a person's experience while browsing the website or a specific web page. In order to improve satisfaction, we must offer a clear and engaging path to all of our visitors. The same applies for search engines, as they try to understand the contents of our website in order to decide if and when to present them to users. From this basic concept, a synergy is born between the user experience and SEO, and it is based on many elements, such as Titles Already from the title tag and from the headings H1 and H2, the user must immediately understand the topics described in order to browse the web page. Navigation. A website that has a well-organized menu is easily navigable by both users and search engine bots. Speed. If a web page loads quickly, the user is inclined to stay on the website. Otherwise, the frustration of waiting could lead him to pursue his search for the same content elsewhere, most likely on a competitor's web page. Mobile. Having a website that is not properly accessible or terribly slow on a smartphone could lead to SEO problems. Technology. If, for example, you use flash elements, there may be incompatibilities with smartphone viewing. In order to make the content of your website understandable to the human eye, remember to use legible fonts, I suggest at least 16px, and use spaces in order to adequately align the various sections or paragraphs with each other. There are many other elements which definitely make the navigation more enjoyable such as the use of meaningful images, engaging quizzes, links to internal resources, tool tips with explanations, and many, many other creative elements. On the other hand, there are practices that certainly worsen the user experience, including the excessive use of pop-ups and interstitials for marketing purposes, or the use of links too close to each other, which makes it difficult to tap on the desired resources, especially on mobile devices. Going straight to the point, the breadcrumbs are navigational aids because they show the hierarchy of the website's pages to the user. In other words, this element helps avoiding the loss of the visitor by allowing them to find orientation within the website and thus improving the user experience. As I already said, this discourse is not only valid for human users, but also for search engines. 
Therefore, the breadcrumbs are of great help for indexing and for understanding how the website is organized. The concept of breadcrumbs derives from the famous fairy tale of Hansel and Gretel by the Grimm brothers, in which the two protagonists of the fairy tale used the trick of creating a road trace with breadcrumbs in order to find their way home when they were in the forest. In our specific case, a breadcrumb is a text path with anchor text and links generally placed at the top of the page and implemented using structured data through microdata or JSON-LD. It is considered by Google because it is shown in SERPs inside the snippets URL section of your website. As mentioned above, the function is hierarchical, but there are some cases in which breadcrumbs are used for attributes, such as the color or sizes of clothes in an e-commerce store. Here are some incorrect uses of breadcrumbs, which I noticed on my students' sites. Multiple categories. Showing different categories for the same page can be confusing and even harmful. Multiple lines. We should try to show the path in a single line, except for mobile versions, otherwise it takes up, literally, too much space. Keyword stuffing. Anchor text must not be over-optimized by continually reproposing the same and identical keyword in an extremely unnatural way. Have you ever wondered how you should structure a web page effectively? Each site is equipped with various structural components, which also have a very precise function from the SEO perspective. We will now see the essential elements that make up the web page's layout, with particular reference to the user experience's importance. We shouldn't waste time and go straight to the point. When you think about a website, some specific elements of a web page will cross your mind. You must know that, in recent years, many structural elements have been significantly modified thanks to the advent of entities such as HTML5, in addition to the layout changes due to design requirements. If we think about the web page of a classic blog, we can immediately distinguish some very precise elements. Header. The upper part of the website, which usually contains the navigation menu, navbar, and the logo. Content. Body. The central part of the website, containing video or text, which represents the actual content of the page. Footer. Located at the bottom of the web page, the footer contains links to contracts, privacy, and legal notes. Side column, or sidebar. It is not always present, but it's usually found on the right side and it shows advertising banners, links to internal articles, or other related site content. Without needing a design course, it's clear that, in recent years, we have gone from a three-column layout to a simpler, minimalist layout with two columns, and, in many more futuristic cases, even to one single column. Content organization. As in life, the organization of a website is fundamental. I often see sites with articles assigned to not-so-relevant categories because there wasn't a clear organization of topics in the beginning. Instead, in my experience, I do the exact opposite. Usually, I start from drafting a series of categories and then go to compile the list of articles, which should be perfectly integrated with the chosen topics. Most experts already know that I am referring to the so-called SEO siloing. By doing so, I'm going to create a series of themes and categories, and inside them I insert relevant contents. A very illustrative analogy is represented by the chapters of a book. We can think of a website as a nice book made up of various chapters. Obviously, all the pages included in a chapter must be related to the topic covered. The SEO siloing therefore allows us to increase the relevance of the contents within the same category, thus facilitating the indexing thanks to an excellent keyword relevancy. But how does this work in practice? Here are some tricks that I would use in order to do SEO siloing of a website dedicated to women's diet. 1. Categories. I would define 5 to 10 thematic categories and assign a very specific keyword for each also in the URL. Diet in pregnancy. Dot com slash diet dash in dash pregnancy slash hashtag article hashtag. Menopausal diet. Dot com slash menopausal dash diet slash hashtag article hashtag. Losing weight for women. 
dot com slash lose dash weight dash women slash hashtag article hashtag muscles for women dot com slash muscle dash women slash hashtag article hashtag beauty diet dot com slash beauty dash diet slash hashtag article hashtag two harmonize content think of ten articles for each category. Don't make some categories based on one article and other categories based on 25. For example, in the category Gym for Women, I would insert the title .com slash muscle dash women slash easy dash fitness, but not .com slash muscle dash women slash food dash anti dash wrinkle. Internal links. When does it make sense to insert textual thematic links between one article and another in order to reinforce the relevance of the topics? If the project becomes complex, like an e-commerce, you can proceed by using sublevels, like home, to muscles, women, to legs, without exaggeration. The basic concept is to enclose all those contents that bind to each other in thematic blocks, in order to increase the relevance of the text on one hand, and to have a simple but intelligent organization of the topics on the other hand. Few people know that one of the easiest methods to give search engines guidance on the topics of their articles is the use of some special signals, which are often little used, because, in my opinion, they are completely misunderstood by those who are approaching SEO. In addition to breadcrumbs, which we have already talked about before, inserting other internal links in a web page definitely improves the user experience, because it returns and highlights a content directly related to the current web page. Based on the number of links used in the layout, it will be easy to understand which are the most important pages of the website. Having an internal linking strategy certainly plays a significant role in improving the SEO of an entire website. But what do you need to know in order to correctly use internal links? Content-Related Connections By following internal links, Googlebot scans the pages of the website in order to determine importance, relevance, and connections between the content. Link value. This depends on the position within the page. The more it is visible, the more powerful it is. We must also consider how many other links are present on the web page. The less, the better. The backlinks is number, and the quality of the web page should also be considered. Usually, the home page has quite a few of them, and that's why the internal links on this page have the best effect. An ideal internal linking structure should have the most important content linked from many web pages, and, at the same time, relevant pages should be linked to each other. I realize that it may seem a bit too theoretical, so let's try out a practical example. A women's diet website could have the homepage containing a link to a guide page that shows all the various types of diets, within which there may be references to the article Top 3 Foods During Pregnancy. On the other hand, Putting a link to this article directly on the home page would be a waste, unless it is part of the latest post section. So, where should the internal links be inserted? The menu or navbar. This should only contain the categories or really fundamental pages, because this element will be present throughout the website and will give a very high relevance and importance to the internal contents. Side column. The related articles, the most popular or most commented ones, can be inserted in the sidebar with thumbnails or small preview images. Body. Links can make sense even within the text of the article if they add value to the topic, when it cannot be treated in the current article due to space or relevance issues. Remember that the number of links also depends on the website type. An e-commerce by its nature will obviously contain more links than a blog landing page. On the other hand, as I have verified several times on some of my students' websites, it is absolutely necessary to eliminate the credits to the theme's author's links, if the license allows it, and to the links to the tag archives, authors, and all other pages, except for some special cases, because they do not contain useful content for visitors or for the search engines. So far, I have talked about when and where to insert a link, but how about doing it the right way? We have already analyzed the concept of link value. If you must show a link that leads to a useless page for search engines, such as, for example, a login page, you should use the nofollow tag in order to signal its low importance. 
The diatribe on the do follow no follow speech is still very hot, and many believe they are now outdated tags. But personally, I continue to take them into consideration, and later I will also explain why. The second component of a link is the anchor text, meaning the clickable text. Be very careful not to abuse it by using specifically optimized keywords, because this type of over-optimization has been the subject of specific Google updates, like Penguin, and the risk of being penalized for these practices is still high. Use common sense and use anchor text with keywords that make sense in your context, without pushing too much on optimization. If we refer to a link in the article's body, my suggestion is to use a sentence of at least four words. Sitemap. Is it really fundamental? First, you need to understand that the sitemap is simply the list of URLs for a site. There are various types of sitemaps, and the most commonly used are the following. HTML sitemap. This is a page designed for the human visitor, and it shows a list of links with hierarchies aimed to help the navigator to browse the website. It is often linked in the footer of all pages and helps browsing the website, but is not strictly necessary. XML sitemap. XML is a meta language that has become famous due to the electronic billing used in Italy. Regarding the sitemap, it allows you to assign a series of attributes to the URLs within a list. It is not mandatory, but it can lead to considerable advantages, which we will also see shortly, further on. The primary function of an XML sitemap is to let search engines know how many contents are present on the website by providing info on their location. All of this information is contained in a .xml file that speeds up the crawling process and consequently the indexing of the entire website. Although it is not necessary, I definitely advise my clients to have an XML sitemap in some specific cases. E-commerce websites or portals with a high number of pages, blogs which are frequently updated with new articles, and websites with many internal links. If you do not have a sitemap, your site will still be indexed and will not suffer many SEO penalties, but it may take a lot longer to be indexed and some pages may remain hidden until the crawler discovers them by itself. Now let's see what are the main tags that, in addition to the header, make up an XML sitemap. Lock, or location, contains the URL address of the content. Last mod, last modified. This is optional and indicates the date of the last modification. Change frec, change frequency. In the past, it showed how often to visit a web page, but it is now a disregarded tag. Priority. On a scale of 0.0 to 1 in the past, the priority indicated the importance of a current page compared to the other web pages. Remember that the file must be limited to a maximum of 50,000 URLs for 50 megabytes in size. You can also use gzip compression in order to reduce its weight, and you can split the file into various XML sitemaps in case your website has a very high number of pages. In this case, I usually organized a sitemap-index.xml, which contains sub-sitemaps, even if other SEO specialists directly create multiple indexes, such as sitemap-index2.xml. There are several free WordPress plugins for generating this type of file, such as Yoast's SEO. Every CMS, Content Management System, has a more or less free solution to do it, but the important thing is to use dynamic generations in such a way that with each new content insertion, the sitemap is updated automatically. Don't forget to send the XML sitemap to your Google Search Console account, otherwise it will not be used. Some experts advise to insert the address in the robots.txt file, but, in my opinion, doing so ends up giving important data to the competitors on the structure of your website, so I strongly advise against it. At this point, you are probably wondering, do I have to insert all the web pages in the sitemap, or do I have to select some of them? There are some contents that are not important or that should not even be reported to Google. You should avoid including, within a sitemap, any of the following. URLs with duplicate content, URLs containing parameters, URLs with redirects, URLs blocked by robots.txt or meta no index, URLs with 404 or 503 errors. 
Contrary to what some people think, it does not mean that these contents will never be indexed, because Google might discover them from external backlinks and may decide to include them in its own index. You should know that a server returns one of the various status codes, for example, errors 404 and 503, when the user requests a specific resource. Problems may easily emerge from these situations. Here are the main status codes, which I suggest you should learn. 200. The server returns a correct answer. 301. Permanently moved. The page has been moved to a new location. 302. Temporarily moved. The page has been temporarily moved to a new location and may return to the previous address in the future. 404 not found. The requested page was not found. 410 content deleted. The page was not found because the content was intentionally removed without any intention of replacing it. 503 service unavailable. It is often used during site maintenance. It can also occur when a plugin generates conflicts or in the event of a script error, which could impact the accessibility of the entire website. When Googlebot visits a page and gets a 404 error code, it may remove the page from the search results. It will then try to verify if the content has returned. As I often say to students, 404 errors are also a nuisance for users, and we must try to avoid them as much as possible. The two methods I recommend in order to find out if a website has these problems are Search Console. Inside the panel, there is a section with a list of broken links, with all the pages involved. However, this report is often incomplete and only illustrative. Paid Crawler. The most famous tool is Screaming Frog, which allows you to visit all the pages of a website within a few minutes and then showing a complete report of all the errors found. But what happens when a 404 error is discovered? The approaches vary depending on the number of web pages involved and the possibility of replacing these errors. If it's a few dozen pages, you can consider checking the links by hand and fixing them by entering the correct address or by creating a new content to replace the missing page. If, on the other hand, it's about hundreds or thousands of 404s, obviously it is a technical problem, and you should check where, how, and why the situation was created. In my experience, I discover similar situations, basically due to a relative infinite loop. Now let's see the details. The crawler follows each link on the web page, and when it finds, for example, a relative link in the sidebar such as a href equals article. It will follow the address article slash article, where it will find the same link, which this time will lead to article slash article slash article. This process will practically continue indefinitely following pages that do not exist. Crawling was actually the core business of one of my previous startups. The relative infinite loop situation often occurs in amateur or small websites. Therefore, it was necessary to contact the webmaster in order to inform him of the big problem that he ignored. Another delicate situation occurs during technical interventions performed on the website, thus making some content inaccessible. If the bot passed during these minutes, it wouldn't be able to view the correct content of the pages and this might damage ranking positions, even though, in reality, an hour later, the web pages would be fully functional. In order to avoid such disasters, I suggest showing a 503 error code to inform Google that we are working on a server, and this way it should try again later automatically. We're starting to understand the terminology. The URL, Uniform Resource Locator, is the address of an internet resource, and it is composed of some fundamental parts that are not always present all at the same time. Protocol, for example, HTTPS. Host or domain, for example, getseofix.com. Path, login, parameters, question mark access equals true. Talking about SEO, the web page address is one of the first things the user notes when he is about to choose which result to click on on a Google web page. Therefore, the choice of the URL will affect the click-through rate, CTR, and consequently the number of visitors that the website will have. At the structure level, as mentioned in the previous chapters, I am a fan of siloing, 
and therefore I often like to insert the keyword of categories also in the URL. For example, I would use .com slash food pregnancy slash recipes instead of .com slash recipes. This approach makes sense for an e-commerce with various products or for a blog which deals with some very specific topics, but if you have a news website, the situation can change. For example, working on Google News, you probably know already that most traffic comes from recent news and is important to highlight the date. Precisely for this reason, many newspapers have a structure like this. Site.com slash 2020 slash 04 slash 21 slash title, which is very good for the above mentioned purposes. Applying the same scheme to a blog or to an e-commerce would be counterproductive instead. Another structure that I have used a lot in the past is the short URL. By omitting the categories, I went directly to the article, for example, site.com slash title, but I preserved the organization in categories through the breadcrumbs directly in the HTML code. Having seen some various structures, I would like to give you some hints and suggestions for a quick URL optimization. Relevant keyword. If it is not in the domain, at least put it in the web page by using dashes, the dash, not the underscore, instead of spaces. Avoid stop words or articles and conjunctions in order to reduce the length. For example, I prefer to use .com slash monitor dash site instead of .com slash monitor dash the dash site. Length. The user does not like to read a very long URL, and this is why we prefer short domains. Consider also that Google truncates the URL after 512 pixels by inserting dots. Parameters. I have always hated parameters and I preferred to use the mod rewrite, which is an Apache module for URL rewriting. As an example, instead of .com slash question mark p equals pregnancy, it is preferable to use .com slash pregnancy. Absolute links. In order to avoid the disaster caused by incorrect relative links, I suggest in using absolute links, such as a a href equals https dot www dot get seo fix slash monitor dash site instead of a href monitor dash site. Up until 2010, there was very little to say about mobile, but with the advent of social networks, the use of portable devices such as smartphones and tablets has certainly spread widely. You probably already know that these devices are not only used for entertainment, but, in many cases, for daily research, and they have replaced the use of the classic desktop. The term mobile SEO was born with the need to optimize websites, in order to provide optimal consultation of the web pages from various portable devices. Today, about 60% of the searches performed on Google are done via mobile devices, and this trend is constantly... I'm not implying that laptops will be abandoned, because notebooks and mobile devices respond to different needs. Data regarding the use of mobile devices vary according to the niche market, time of year, geolocation, and many other factors. I can often see a massive presence of these devices among my website as in the following case. From my point of view, there is now a mass of people entering the internet world who, in the past, did not own a computer, or if they did, they used it very little. Let us remember that it was exactly Google who released the Mobile Friendly Update, or Mobile get in, in 2015, in order to penalize those websites that were not optimized for mobile access. Furthermore, in 2018, Google announced the Mobile First Index. From that moment on, the search results are based on indexing the website's mobile version. This obviously also affects desktop searches. There are two separate approaches when it comes to optimization for mobile. Multiple versions. With this type of approach, there are two sites created, site.com and m.site.com. An automatic redirect takes the user to the correct version based on the type of device they are using. Otherwise, while keeping the same URL, a dynamic system loads different HTML and CSS based on the type of device used. The disadvantage is that in terms of content and technical management, this solution becomes particularly complex. Responsive design. The page layout adapts according to the user's resolution, 
maintaining the same URL, and avoiding redirects. I've always been a fan of this solution because, in my opinion, it is the best and easiest way to handle cross-device compatibility. In order to verify that your website does not have accessibility problems on mobile devices, you can use the special Google Mobile Friendly Test, which offers many practical indications regarding the interventions needed. Consider that you will probably use custom JS and CSS. I would like to anticipate here that blocking these external resources in the robots.txt file is a bad idea because Google would not be able to view the page correctly. In the past, Google has released special updates against invasive pop-ups and interstitials in order to improve the user experience. I also advise you to avoid them on mobile devices because the user will definitely be annoyed by their presence on such a small device, not to mention the potential SEO penalties. Speaking of mobile SEO, I tell my students to check their websites for the following aspects. Loading speed. Especially with a 3G mobile connection, it is essential that the page loads quickly by reducing the size of the included assets. Readability. Pay attention to the font size of the characters, at least 16px, and the titles. A 50px headline may be acceptable on desktop, but on mobile, it becomes invasive. Menu. Use the famous hamburger menu, those three lines that activate a drop-down menu in the header next to the logo. Images. Make sure that there is a CSS code aiming to adapt the image to the width of the device. Spaces. Use spaces between buttons and paragraphs because on mobile devices, the fingers cannot press the correct target if the elements are too close together. I would like to conclude this section by talking about Google's AMP, Accelerated Mobile Pages, project because, in my opinion, it has been over-speculated during the past years. AMP is a technology built to show web pages at an extreme speed on mobile devices. The websites that use it can be recognized by the lightning icon next to the snippet in the search results page. At a theoretical level, it seems to help the CTR, but at what cost? Ads management is very limited. Graphics have restrictions on style sheets and reduce both branding and graphic customization. And link building, a backlink to your AMP version is not a link to your domain, but to google.com slash AMP slash S slash site. I must say that I tested it out of curiosity, but I abandoned it almost right away. I prefer to optimize the speed of my graphic template rather than having fast pages, but with the disadvantages described above. Don't get me wrong, because I hate trivializing. But in this section, I would just like to give you some fundamental indications on doing SEO for the main platforms, given the fact that for an in-depth discussion, each suggestion alone would probably deserve an entire book. For e-commerce platforms, one of the most used scripts is certainly Magneto, and, although it requires a minimum configuration in order to improve its indexability, it is probably the most friendly among the free solutions. Let's see what we need to pay attention to for SEO purposes. Duplicate content. Speaking of online stores, it is normal to have hundreds if not thousands of product pages. Therefore, the risk of having duplicate content is considerable. That's why it is a good practice to activate the option Canonical Link Meta Tags for Categories and Products in order to assign a single official version to each web page. This avoids the generation of duplicate content and consequent potential penalties due to sorting filters, irrelevant variates, or pagination. Sitemap. For an e-commerce website with many pages, the other fundamental point is the use of a dynamically generated sitemap through a special extension, such as Dynamic HTML Sitemap for Magneto 2, for example. URL. Another good thing to do is to have an SEO-friendly URL by activating the Use Web Server Rewrites option in the Configuration section. Title and Description In order to rank each individual product or category, you will have to manually enter unique texts in the Catalog section for each item. The same applies to image files which should contain a relevant name, for example, sunglassescartier.jpg instead of image-7364.jpg. From the panel, you should also assign a relevant alt, alternative text tag, such as Brand KG Sunglasses. Speed. 
Having fast pages will not only influence the number of visitors who see your products, but will also allow you to improve the sales conversion and will certainly offer a more positive user experience. My first recommendation in order to achieve this goal is to activate the cache management option, and the second is to merge the CSS and JS files in the panel Configuration Developers. These are quite delicate practices and it is mandatory to check that they don't cause conflicts or problems inside the website. On the other hand, if we talk about blogs, the most used platform is surely WordPress, and there are a myriad of optimizations for the CMS content management system. Let's see the most useful ones. URL. The structure of the permalinks should usually be changed from .com slash question mark p equals 313 to .com slash article dash title by entering slash percent postname percent slash in settings permalinks. Or, if you want to use a siloing structure, you will need to use slash percent category percent slash percent postname percent slash. SEO plugin. I suggest installing Yoast SEO because it allows you to auto-generate an updated sitemap and to define the title tags and meta descriptions for each post in an extremely simple manner. Cache. I've been using Comet Cache, X Zen Cache, for years because it is a relatively light but effective plugin in order to serve the user a previously saved version of the content without having to make database queries all the time to serve the same page. Content Index. By using the TOC, Table of Contents, at the beginning of an article, the user can benefit from a quick preview of the content. Furthermore, Google may already include links to the internal sections of the web page in the search results, thus increasing the visibility of your contents in the SERP compared to the web pages of your competitors. You can achieve this by using a free plugin like Table of Contents Plus. Rich Snippets if you propose product reviews, publish recipes, or have content that can be represented with a schema.org microdata, then you should use a plugin, such as WP Product Review, to get rich snippets in Google results, increasing the visibility of your page. Publication dates. If your site benefits from the time, for example financial news, then it is optimal to show the date in the snippet. On the contrary, if you propose evergreen content, which you will never update, it could be counterproductive, given that people do not like to read old content, such as, for example, that published five years ago. To show or hide the date, you can use the Date in Snippet Preview option in the Content Types tab of Yoast SEO. Heavy Plugins Avoid having 20 or 30 plugins activated because they slow down the website without providing other benefits, and you probably don't even need them. You can find out what they are by using the Query Monitor plugin which shows you how long the queries on the database take in order to identify bottlenecks. Another useful tip is avoid having all plugins loaded on all pages. For example, it makes no sense for the user to download the style sheets or JS dependencies of an email sending plugin if this form is not present on the web page. In order to choose which plugins to disable in specific pages or posts, use the plugin organizer. Drupal and Joomla can also be used for company sites while for e-commerce there is a strong growth in Shopify and PrestaShop. Let's not forget about the extremely high-performance solutions in terms of loading speed, based on Node.js, like Ghost and Keystone.js. The concepts reported so far apply to all platforms, even those that have been developed recently. In my experience, however, I would stick to those that have been tested and developed for years now, and also have a strong supporting community with myriads of plugins or extensions to integrate those features which, otherwise, would be quite expensive to develop from scratch. In my case, since the 2.0 version was launched in 2006, I used WordPress a lot. Currently, it's gone beyond 5.0, with significant changes especially in terms of features and free plugins availability, which allow us to achieve anything we want. In 90% of the cases in which I am required to work on WordPress, I can easily find a plugin that offers a ready and free solution. It may need to be adapted further on, but it certainly avoids having to spend hundreds or thousands of dollars on custom development by hiring an external developer. It should be crystal clear that the articles you will publish on the website should not be a mass of keywords 
as it happened up to five years ago. Today, the articles must provide real help for the user and offer an excellent user experience, especially in a post-rank brain period. After this fundamental premise, you should know that content marketing is perfectly interlinked with SEO. Instead of improvising with each article, the use of an editorial plan is the best possible choice in order to be able to constantly publish excellent quality content. If you decide to organize your content marketing by a real, scheduled calendar, you will have a series of important advantages. Complete in-depth analysis. You won't risk to forget covering any topic because you've already prepared the planning and put everything on the table right from the beginning. ROI evaluation. Writing down costs, time, or money that must be paid to someone would be advisable in order to understand right up front how much content will have to be produced and to avoid investing too much compared to the expected result. Deadlines overview. In addition to content titles, your calendar should also identify publication dates in order to know exactly what is published and when. You will be able to plan any expansions or other marketing activities knowing perfectly when you should do it. In terms of marketing, you will need to create content for each user phase or the customer journey. Awareness. The user realizes that his need can be solved, but does not know yet exactly how. The contents of this phase should be shareable on social networks and inspirational, with infographics or visual elements. Research. The user looks for data and answers to their questions. Preferably, these contents should be guides in order to help the user learn about the subject. Purchase. The user has decided to purchase. You can use your comparison tables showing the differences between your service and the competitor's one. But why all these differences? Do they make any sense? If you have only inspirational articles on your website, but you don't provide either guides or comparison tables, the user probably won't know that you're offering a service. On the other hand, if you only push on the comparisons through Google, you will never attract all the audience that doesn't yet know about the existence of a product to solve their problem. For example, if you created a beautiful comparison between electronic invoicing softwares, you would have very little traffic interested in finding the differences between products and immediately ready to purchase things. If, in addition to the comparative tables, you include articles with legislative in-depth information on the fact that electronic invoicing is mandatory, awareness phase, and guides on how it works, research phase, you would certainly have more visitors, which could progressively be converted into customers. Here are the steps that I generally follow for the construction and implementation of a good editorial plan. Brainstorming. Use the keyword generation tools in addition to your personal ideas in order to create a list of potential topics. Organization. In a blog, for example, you can define 5 to 10 categories and a dozen articles for each. Publishing. You decide how often to publish content. Personally, I opt for 2 to 3 articles a week. Depending on your specific project, you can adjust this frequency to your preference. Distribution. After publishing, you should do a minimum of content promotion by sharing articles on social networks or by sending an email to your newsletter subscribers. It will seem obvious, but not all content on a site is of the same type, because they respond to different purposes. Each page must have a purpose, which can vary from sharing on the social network to signing up for a newsletter, up to filling out a quote request, and so on. From this point of view, just waiting or hoping will not be enough in order to convince the user to do one of these actions, just because our website looks nice. We will clearly need to do some very specific interventions aiming to persuade the user to do even one of these actions. In addition to the web page's layout and all the marketing concepts that make up its conversion optimization, we can create a text that is engaging and forces a user to do a precise action. On a psychological level, when I address this issue, I apply some principles taken from the book Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion by Robert Cialdini, which can be summarized as follows. Reciprocity. When someone offers us something, we feel compelled to reciprocate. The lead magnets, for example, enter your email address and receive a free gift, meet this principle. Social proof. 
In making decisions, we often rely on what others do. E-commerce reviews are a great example of what social proof is. The clear abuse of this method is false opinions. Authority. The best example of what is meant by authority is the esteem generally held towards doctors or lawyers. If an expert writes something in an article, it is often taken for granted, even if the user has not verified it at all. Scarcity. Given the fact that human beings value resources that are few or rare, the example that comes to mind is the e-commerce slogan, last 20 pieces or 20 pieces left. Sympathy. We like to listen and spend time with those who seem nice to us, and that is why we often come back to read the blog of our favorite designer, for example. Commitment. It is the classic example of the so-called upsell, when we have already purchased a product and we immediately get another offer to purchase an accessory. These are just a few examples to apply to your website, but creativity is boundless, and you can think of other ways to help you write more persuasive and conversation-oriented texts. It is not difficult to understand that in Google search results, the public's attention immediately goes to the title of each result, and it is precisely for this reason that we should ensure that we distinguish ourselves from all of our competitors in order to attract the greatest number of visitors. If your article is wonderful, but the title is cold or mediocre, you will not succeed, so take a few minutes to think about a good title. An effective headline that attracts attention, stimulates curiosity, how to grow an orchid in 15 minutes a week, includes the benefit of the product or service, create an infographic in three minutes, contains a question, how can I walk the dog in crowded places, works as a definitive resource, Complete Guide to Vegan Cuisine in 2020. Includes the main keyword at the beginning. Electronic Invoice, the complete guide. Has the title case format, Tricks for Growing Orchids at Home, instead of Tricks for Growing Orchids at Home, without capitalization. For tricks lovers and in order to increase CTR, the title should include odd numbers, brackets, symbols, obtained with the HTML code, and current year. I realize that it is not simple, but I suggest referring to newspapers, magazines, or directly to other competitors in the search engine results pages, or SERPs, in order to find interesting ideas to use in your own title. Speaking of writing tools, we think about the classic Microsoft Word, Google Docs, or WordPress editor. But be careful. I often notice formatting errors due to the fact that, by copying a text from Microsoft Word directly into an editor such as WordPress, you could paste different formatted values, such as apostrophes, invisible paragraphs, and other elements that ruin the content layout. In this specific case, I always suggest to check that the paste operation produces a text that is perfectly faithful to the original one. If you find issues, you can use a neutral intermediate editor like Notepad++ in order to remove all the rules formats present in complex software such as MS Word. And now, let's see exactly what I mean by defining an SEO-friendly text structure. A. Keywords. First of all, you will have to search for the main keyword, maybe a medium tail keyword, on which to focus the entire article by using the tools and methods already described in the previous chapters. You should enter the previous keywords that you have identified and strategic positions of the text. In the title, the first paragraph, subtitles like H2 or H3, the URL, avoiding stop words like articles and conjunctions, and the tag title and meta description. Let's be clear about one thing. I'm not saying that you have to do keyword stuffing and over-optimize these elements but you will simply have to try and make the keywords appear when and if it makes sense in these positions. Maybe not the same one, but variants, synonyms, or LSI keywords. B. Images. At this point, you could insert a particularly relevant image for the article immediately after the title, making sure that it does not take up too much space, especially on mobile devices, because the user would be forced to scroll down the page just to see even the first line of the post. You will be able to insert other images throughout the rest of the article, but pay particular attention to the following elements. Alt text. 
enter a description of the image. For example, Summer Garden Orchid. File name. Rename the file with a particularly relevant name. For example, garden-orchid.png. Dimension. Compress the file size in order to speed up the loading of your web page. C. Internal links or external links. The links' value flows through all of the pages of your website and is divided by the number of connection links. If we want to push a few pages, we need to point several links to their URLs. To do this, we have two possibilities. Internal links. Within the text of an article, I insert a hypertext link leading to another relevant article with an anchor text containing one or more topic-related keywords, but without forcing the optimization. External links. Our site cannot cover every topic, and this is why we may need to refer to external sources. In this case, I suggest using a target equals underscore blank attribute in the link in order to open the external article in a new tab and still keep our site open. And if the resource is really useful and authoritative, we avoid using the rel equals nofollow because it would be counterproductive. D. Readability. Consider that nowadays, the user experience has an enormous value within the Google algorithm. We should keep some important tricks in mind. Font. For good readability, I suggest a font size of at least 16px and a sans-serif font, without extending features called serifs at the end of strokes, as in the case of Open Sans, Lato, or Roboto. Subtitles. H2, H3, and H4 headlines are important for detaching and separating the various sections of the article and help the visitor with orientation. Spaces. It is important to let the reader breathe between paragraphs, images, or other elements. Paragraphs. The tag p slash p encloses the paragraphs, and with CSS rules you can also define which margins to apply, margin colon asterisk px, in addition to the vertical distance between lines of text, line-height, colon, asterisk, px, in order to facilitate reading. Try to write a maximum of two to three lines per paragraph. Colors. It is a good idea to use underlined text or change the color of clickable words, such as the hypertext links. Emphasis. The bold, or italics, can help you emphasize certain parts of the text, which are considered particularly important. Attention. A text must keep the user's attention, and this is why you will have to either hire copywriters or take the time to learn the art of writing for the World Wide Web. To all these elements, you can add your creativity in order to offer an engaging content for readers aiming to offer a truly satisfying user experience. I often read articles about SEO with phrases like, you must write at least 1,000 words. This indication certainly has a shareable basis, but it can be a bit misleading. As you might imagine, one of the most frequent questions I receive is, how long should an article be? The answer? Well, there is no predefined number, and there is a specific reason. If I had, for example, a website where I show the weather forecasts of the various American cities day by day, would it make sense to write 1,000 words for a reader who is simply looking to know, what's the weather like tomorrow in New York? Obviously, this person wants to know only if it will be sunny, the temperature, and a couple of other things, but they certainly have neither the desire nor the time to read 1,000 words of text. Just think of Google's Featured Snippets, which, as in the case of weather forecasts, shows only the relevant data without frills directly in the search results page. This does not mean, however, that writing in-depth articles is useless. On the contrary, everything depends on the specific case. If we are writing a guide on a certain topic, obviously the user will need to read a lot of information, and Google will reward the good quality content that will be particularly thorough and useful to the web surfers. If you intend to write content that aims to be a guide, try to make it as complete as possible. You will probably need 1,000, 2,000, or even 3,000 words to exhaust the topic at a satisfactory level. If, instead, it is the answer to a simple question, probably 300 to 500 words will be enough. In short, the length depends on the topic and the search keyword of the specific case. 
A more analytical approach shows that generally in the Google.com results, the most common post length in the top positions is around 2,000 words. But this does not mean that it is also ideal for your project. And above all, it definitely does not mean that this was the primary factor that has led Big G to rank those sites so high. I'm sure that whoever has a blog with many articles of about 2,000 words has made a considerable investment in content marketing and has done many other SEO actions that will add up to the word count. Among my projects, I also have recent sites that, with a few 150-word articles, generate good traffic volumes and with excellent conversion rates. In conclusion, the length of the article certainly affects the algorithm in some way. But, in addition to the fact that it must be contextualized on the specific research, remember that the SEO factors are as many as 200. In order to know the length of content in real time, you can use directly the Interface Open Office Writer functionality from the Tools and Word Count menu, or using the appropriate tool on getseofix.com tools. Going straight to the point, the approach of doing SEO actions on our pages, modifying code and other elements, falls completely under our control and forms of the so-called on-page SEO, which differs from off-page SEO, which includes backlinks and other topics which we can only partially influence. In a nutshell, the title tag, inserted in the head section of the page, is basically the title present in the SERPs, search engine results pages, for each result, and it plays a fundamental role in attracting the user's attention, given the fact that it determines the first impression. Furthermore, the title will appear in the browser tab's header and it will be automatically shown in the preview of the shared post on the social networks – Twitter, Facebook, etc. – even if it is possible to edit it with other specific meta tags – meta name equals Twitter, title, content equals, or meta property, OG, title, content equals. A good title has the following characteristics. It's not all uppercase. It is never over-optimized repeating a keyword over and over again. It is unique throughout the site. There should be no pages sharing the same title tag. The main keyword must be inserted towards the beginning of the title. It contains the brand name only if it is important. In an EMD, exact match domain, it could be useless and it would only occupy space. Take advantage of all the available length but don't go any further. If you love tweaks, you can try entering parentheses or symbols in order to get the user's attention. Talking about the structure instead, I generally use the following. Main keyword, dash, secondary keyword, vertical dash, brand. For example, title, SEO tools, dash, on page analysis, vertical dash, get SEO fix, slash title. At this point, you are wondering if there is a length limit given the fact that the space in the snippet is limited. For a desktop result, the maximum length displayed is 70 characters, while for mobile devices it is 78 characters. Actually, talking about characters is not correct, because in reality the width is based on pixels, and some characters, like W, occupy much more space than a T, but we often refer to characters instead of pixels. Now, which length should you choose? In terms of ROI, return on investment, if you notice from your reports that a site performs much better on mobile, you could choose to optimize it for these devices, and at the cost of affecting the desktop results, you could take advantage of the 78 characters length. In my opinion, considering that these limits are constantly changing, as it has already happened in the past and as it will probably happen in the future, it makes sense to opt for a middle ground. Personally, I try to stay within the 60 characters limit. So, is the title tag fundamental? I would say yes, even if sometimes I hear phrases like the following, title tag is useless because Google shows what it wants. Although the title tag should always be used, it may happen that Google decides not to show it and create its own. In my experience, this has happened in some cases of over-optimization of keywords or when the query term was not very relevant with a title text. Meta Description Not everyone knows that the meta description, inserted in the head section of the page, is not an HTML element, but a simple attribute consisting of a page's brief summary 
which anticipates the user with the content to be read by clicking that result. If the title element was used in the title tag, an attribute should be used for the description. Meta name equals description, content equals sample summary. Speaking of length, I generally use 160 characters, even if the limit varies a lot depending on the query term, and it might reach up to 290 characters in some cases. There has always been a strong debate on whether the meta description is an SEO factor or not. But the truth, beyond the Google official negative response, is that this element has an enormous impact in terms of indirect influence or the user's desire to click on an interesting result or not. Knowing that the user experience is certainly considered by Google, then we can conclude that the meta description is also influential. You will have noticed that, when you search for something, the relevant keywords are shown in bold in the meta description of the results, which is why this snippet should be optimized from the SEO perspective, as well as for copywriting. As I have already mentioned within the title tag section, remember the following. It is not binding. In some cases, Google may decide to rewrite meta descriptions by itself in order to make them more relevant to the user. Avoid duplicates. Different pages with the same description can confuse the user. Social networking. It is used in the post's preview. In order to analyze the meta tags easily without having to open the web page's source code, you can use my tool, available on getseofix.com tools. Header tags. Essentially, the header tags are all those subtitles used in a text for better organizing the topic and making it easier for the reader to understand it without getting lost, especially in posts of 1,000 or more words. The main one is the tag H1. It may be the same or differ from the title tag's text, even if its function is to identify the web page's title. It is inserted directly within the content and not in the head section, as it happens in the case of meta description and title tags. Then there are the tags h2, h3, h4, h5, and h6. Consider as the number increases, the font size will be smaller, as will their importance for the search engines. The h2 are like real chapters on the web page. Increasing the number, we will move on to less important subsections, although all these tags play an important role in organizing the appearance and structure of a page. A recent advantage of using the H2 or the H3 is that, in case of objects list, for example, the six Christmas gifts to get for your girlfriend, Google might consider them for the creation of featured snippets and therefore earn an additional space in the SERP. Here are the main features that differentiate H1 tags from the following ones. There must be only one H1 tag for each page. Someone disagrees, but I personally believe this is a rule to follow. The H1 font should have a larger size than the other elements. It should be placed at the top of the page, and it should contain the main keyword. Emphasis and other HTML elements. The fact is this. A few years ago, talking about emphasis elements, there were real diatribes about using strong text slash strong instead of B text slash B while italics was discussed between m text slash m and i text slash i. The absurd thing is that both tags show exactly the same result, but the question was whether Google had any preference on it. As early as 2006, Matt Cutts, Google's head of spam search, had clarified that there was no preference, but speculation went ahead and I think it will also continue in the future. From my point of view, and considering the user experience, Choosing one rather than the other changes nothing at all. At a substantial level, I believe it is important to show text fragments in bold or italics because they help the reader to dwell on important points. The problem is that many people think to over-optimize by using bold text only for the important keywords. The result of this action is particularly artificial and it could also determine a penalty. Being a sea lover, I enjoy living with a feeling of serenity that I get whenever I am on vacation and I take my mask and flippers and I go swimming near the coast, admiring the marine flora and fauna. In my projects, I always try to put bold on full sentences, or at least on four words within the sentence, because I believe that seeing a single word in bold in the middle of a paragraph neither adds any value nor helps with the reading. 
there are many other elements within the HTML meta language. For a complete overview, you should know at least the following, because they are widely used in articles of websites. UL LI element 1 slash LI LI element 2 slash LI slash UL contains a list of elements and aims to form an unordered formatted list. Ahref equals www.getseofix.com slash anchor text slash a. It is used for hypertext links to other web pages of a website or to external sources. The target equals blank attribute will open the new IRL in another tab by keeping the current page open. Table. It organizes data within cells with a header. Thanks to JavaScript and CSS, it is also possible to obtain the ordering by columns in real time or create tables in responsive design. Optimized Images Now, let's focus on image optimization. You must know that the famous alt text performs some functions. Visually Impaired If someone could not see a photograph as they are visually impaired, they would definitely appreciate the access to an alternative in order to understand what the image is about. Description it is required to indicate the keywords and give information on the image's content. Loading. If, for any reason, the image could not be loaded, an alternative text will then be shown to the user. Google Images. Images can provide traffic to your website if they are properly optimized. It is quite easy to fall into the trap of over-optimization for keywords. Let us remember that we only need to provide a precise description by using different keywords within sentences that are readable by humans. We have seen how to optimize the image tag, but there is one last operation we need to do in order to get a really optimized image, the compression. Inserting images in an article can be harmful if we aim to offer an excellent loading speed, but if we make sure that they are properly optimized and do not cause delays, then it should not raise any problems. Here are the two techniques that I generally apply in order to manage the situation. Image file compression. You can do it manually with a WordPress plugin, by using a desktop software, or with an online tool like TinyPNG. Lazy load. This technique allows to have the image downloaded only when the user has scrolled the content until the image is displayed in the browser, and not immediately when the page is loading. You may be wondering if in this situation Google is able to index everything correctly, but if you think about how page rendering works, Big G generally waits a few seconds and then scrolls down to generate all the events that make up the web page. Technically speaking, the implementation is not immediate, but you can use WordPress plugins like Lazy Load in order to enable it in one click. Optimized PDFs Let's be clear on one thing. Google has been able to read and index PDF files since 2001, and this is why we often see them directly among other SERP results. Remember that a PDF is, in reality, a great source of keywords with attractive content and immediately available to read for both Google and human users. When I'm dealing with projects that include PDF files, I apply some tricks. File name. Use the keyword already in the file name. For example, cooking-in-garden.pdf. Title. Set a title with keywords. With Adobe Acrobat DC, you will find the field in File, Document Properties, Title. Description. Set a description with keywords. In Adobe Acrobat DC, you'll find the entry in File, Document Properties, Subject. Compression. If the file includes images, try to load compressed versions in order to save space, since a 100-page PDF can occupy several megabytes if it contains various images. Organization. Use subtitles and paragraphs in order to detach content and make the reading easier. Internal links. Try to insert a link from your website to the PDF file in order to let Google find it and assign a relevant importance. Do not save it as an image. Some tools allow you to save the document into PDF format with non-selectable text. In this case, search engines may have difficulties indexing your document. I would like to point out that a PDF file uploaded to the server is accessible from the address site.com slash filename.pdf, and it is considered as any other page on the website. Text to HTML ratio. 
Without complicating things too much, you need to know that the text to HTML ratio is simply the relationship between the code and the text within a web page. It also includes JavaScript and CSS lines belonging inline to the source code. I reassure you right away by saying that this is not an official SEO factor, even Google's John Mueller confirmed it in the past, but in my opinion, it may have an indirect influence. Having a web page with a lot of code, perhaps with an HTML weight higher than 275 KB, often means increasing the load speed or the rendering time and considering the continuous push to have faster websites. This can be an indirect disadvantage. Basically, you need to make sure that your text to HTML ratio is aligned with that of your competitors and other similar websites within the industry. Generally, for an e-commerce website, the ratio is around 15 to 20 percent, while for blogs we're talking about 25 to 30 percent, especially if we use WordPress with sophisticated themes and plugins. Here are some of the steps to follow in order to improve the text to HTML ratio. Include CSS and JavaScript in external files. Delete HTML comments. And delete unnecessary code. In any case, remember to check the value of this ratio in your competitors' web pages because things change considerably from niche to niche. And in order to easily calculate this ratio, you can use the tool that I've inserted on getseofix.com slash tools. Finally, we have reached one of the most interesting topics, namely the click-through rate, CTR, a metric that indicates the percentage of people who click on a result after seeing it in the SERP. Here is an example of the average CTR from my website in the shopping sector, as reported in the Google Search Console account. Consider that the value will be different for each SERP. If a page appears in the first ranking position, it will be much more visible than on the seventh ranking position result, and consequently, it will have a higher CTR and a particularly high number of visitors, compared to the total number of searches. Hence, the need to bring results higher and higher, but be careful. This is not always the case. There are situations where a lower result can have a higher CTR than the one above it because it may have a more attractive copy or it simply seems a more relevant result to the user. It may not be a direct SEO factor like backlinks are, but it certainly has a very strong impact in indirect terms. In order to understand the importance of CTR, just know that CTR is one of the factors that determine the quality score in pay-per-click campaigns. But how do you improve the CTR in order to have more visitors for your content? Copywriting. As in advertisements, it is important to have a captivating title and description that obtain more attention. Characters. Some special shapes hit more than others. For example, in your title you can use parentheses, odd numbers, or symbols. URL. Include keywords in the URL in order to make it more relevant. Structured data. When possible, show the stars of your reviews based on the microdata, which we will discuss later, because in the SERP, they occupy a lot of space and they are particularly visible. References. If you offer a local service, you can include the current year or the city in order to look like updated content and be relevant to the user. Optimize. Check currently indexed pages and verify the CTR from the appropriate section in your Google Search Console account. Remember that, often, it is enough to change a few words in the title tag in order to get some very important results. Don't forget that if your website is particularly slow to open up, users might immediately go back in the search results page to visit a competitor's website. In general terms, the snippet is a search result shown by Google in the SERPs. We can talk about rich snippet when such a result has something extra and, depending on the niche market or the content type, we obtain additional data such as stars, photographs, or other data. For SEO, the importance of these rich snippets is given by the fact that they attract the public's attention and, consequently, they influence the CTR of the result procuring a greater number of visitors for the article. 
how can you get them on the pages of your website? Google, not always but only at its discretion, shows the rich snippets on the basis of the structured data it finds on your web pages. A special code brings additional informational value to the article, according to a specific format that follows some universal standards and can be interpreted by search engines. Here is a short list of the types of topics that best suit the use of structured data. Books, movies, recipes, events, organizations, people, places, products, offers, and reviews. Schema.org is a project that aims to offer and promote the use of structured data schemes for web pages and email messages. It makes use of the so-called vocabulary available in various encoding or markup, including RDFA, Microdata, and JSON-LD. Among these three options, the easiest way is JSON-LD, JavaScript Object Notation for Linked Data, because it is simply a JavaScript code to be inserted at the bottom of a page, which contains all the additional data. It is no longer necessary to intervene on the HTML as it happens with microdata instead, and risk to complicate the generation of the web page or interfere with the layout structure. On the official website, there are several practical code examples, which you can use directly with your web pages, adapting them to your content and immediately checking the result by using Google's Structured Data Test Tool. In SEO terms, the crawling phase occurs when the Google bot accesses a page and analyzes it, while the indexing occurs when a web page appears to be suitable for inclusion in the search engine index. Since the 1990s, webmasters around the world have used a robots.txt file in the root of their websites to provide any bot with some instructions on how to access their content. In this very simple text file, a disallow directive is inserted containing the paths of the pages or the folders that the bot must not scan in order not to overload the resources of the server. There's also a user agent for referring to a specific bot, like a Google bot, Bing bot, etc. User dash agent asterisk disallow slash secret. In order to generate this file, you can use a specific tool, available on getseofix.com slash tools. In addition to the robots.txt file, we can communicate with the bot crawler through the robots meta tag, which needs to be inserted in the head section of the web page. There are four combinations, alternating between index and follow values with a negative variance. Meta name equals robots, context equals index, comma, follow. For example, using index, comma, follow will allow the bot to index the current web page and also scan the pages linked within its content, while with no index, comma, no follow, we suggest neither indexing the current content nor following the links. By playing with a robots.txt file or the metarobots tag, we can choose which contents to hide or index. Now, this is the theory, because in practice, many smaller bots don't actually care about our directives and they do a wild scan without rules, spoofing the user agent in order to avoid being blocked. At least the main search engines follow our indications, but I have many experiences with minor bad players which are really annoying and difficult to block. This argument is not a simple technicality, as it may have implications in the daily SEO operations. For example, by blocking a page from the robots.txt file, you will ensure that the content will not be analyzed by Google, which will not even know if there is a meta robots with a no index value. In this particular situation, you have a snippet without having read neither the title tag nor the meta description because Google couldn't read them, but the result is still visible. Since it was not able to read it, it couldn't read the meta robots in HTML. These results have the classic formula, a description is not available for this results due to the website's robots.txt file, and they are the outcome of incorrect management. A common mistake for WordPress users is the insertion of the slash WP content folder into the robots.txt file, because this will block access for Googlebot to all the CSS or JS dependencies of the plugins and the graphic theme, thus failing to render the page correctly. Another common move is the inclusion of secret or private paths into this file, but in this way we are revealing to a potential hacker exactly where to hit, and this is not safe at all. We should rather use a no-index meta robots tag 
and a password authentication system. Finally, I remember seeing sites that use the robots.txt file to remove content, thus allowing an almost perpetual indexing because the bot could not access the page to know what it had been removed. In this case, in order to avoid a redirect to a new version of this content, it would have been correct to leave free access to the bots and set a status code of 410 gone, but not a 404 not found, since the resource would never be back available, not even in the future. Many people wonder what they would need in order to have a web page indexed within 60 minutes since its publication. Personally, I don't think it's just a quirk. For those who deal with SEO in a professional manner, knowing immediately where content ranks is important. Although it probably won't be its final position, at least it gives an important signal. In order to speed up or force this process, we need to let Google know that we have published new content on our website, and there are various ways to do that. URL Check In your Search Console account, there is a special section where you can enter the URL of your website and ask Googlebot to scan it and index it as soon as possible. Links By inserting a hyperlink into the new article, we're actually inviting Google to scan it. In order to facilitate this process, we can use the Latest Articles section in the sidebar or on the home page. The same applies to backlinks from external sites. Sitemap by adding the new article to the sitemap.xml list, we're actually making sure that the bot will notice the new article and proceed to its scanning and indexing at the next check. Social sharing. Sharing a new article on social networks is an excellent idea in order to make it stand out. By doing so, it could actually get linked from a web page that is being scanned by Google bots in the next couple of minutes. Ping services. There are dedicated websites that deal with notifying the search engines when a particular website has been updated. I personally assimilate these situations to spam methods, and therefore I do not recommend them. Of all these options, the most effective is generally the first, because it only takes a few minutes to find the article on Google. Obviously, I assume that your site is already indexed in Google, but if not, you can use the site operator followed by the domain, for example, site getseofix.com, and you will be able to see how many and which pages have been indexed so far. If doing SEO on a website can be complex as is, approaching a multilingual project is even more difficult. I will now share the main steps that I generally apply when dealing with these situations. I say upfront that this type of SEO project is not suitable for beginners, but I will do my best to explain it as clear as possible. I have always been attracted to multilingual projects because I believe that, from the scalability point of view, cloning a business of one language into another one can bring great advantages without much effort, considering that the markets can also be very different. It should be noted that the process begins with searches for keywords. But if you already have a website, is it enough to just translate it? Well, it's not that simple. First of all, consider that each language has its own ways and preferences, so a literal translation may be correct, but the public might use query terms with slightly different synonyms or expressions. For example, laptops can be translated into Italian in computer portatile, portatile, or even notebook, but they are completely different key words. You may find that they have different conversion rates, even if the literal meaning is the same. Then, you should know that for European websites, the question of accent in the volumes evaluation must be considered, too. For Italy, the estimated traffic costs for Costi Pedalo, with an accent, may differ from Costi Pedalo and Costi Pedalo, without accents. They are different in form and grammatically incorrect, but people can use them in a web search, and this is the only thing that counts from an SEO perspective, although Google is able to understand that they are exactly the same thing. Having defined the keyword research topic, let's now check how the website should be structured. My students think about particular architectures with creativity, but personally, I reduce everything to three options. Separate domains. Use a national domain for each language. For example, site.it, site.fr, and site.de. 
Subdomains. Use a subdomain of the main.com domain for each language. For example, it.site.com, de.site.com, fr.site.com. Subfolders. Use a subfolder of the main.com domain for each language. For example, website.com slash it, website.com slash de, website.com slash fr. I remind you that a penalty, but also a strong SEO boost, in cases 1 and 2 will be limited respectively to the separate domain and to the subdomain, while in case 3, it will extend to all subfolders and therefore to the entire project. Beyond any technical implementation difficulties, if the domain is a .com and it is your brand, then I do not recommend using national domains to disperse your strength, but I suggest solution 2 or 3. If instead you use an EMD, exact match domain, then, with solution 1, you will be able to translate the domain name and use national extensions to have a competitive advantage. In my projects, I always assign each language version to a particular server with a geolocalized IP address. For example, a Finnish site will have an IP located in Finland, while a German project will have an IP in Germany, and so on. I report below on the performance of a Spanish website of mine with an .es extension and a geolocalized IP in Spain. Let's move on to the contents. Who should I hire for the translation of my website into another language? I do not even consider automatic translation of Google Translate or other automatic services, because in addition to providing a bad user experience, they can lead to syntax or grammar errors. With the experience of having had over 65 different suppliers in the past 10 years, today, in my project, I rely on freelance translators, exclusively native speakers, because even if I may seem old-fashioned, I believe that for a U.S. project, a highly trained Italian translator will never match the work of a native English speaker, especially if I am dealing with particularly technical subjects or topics related to the culture of a foreign country. Speaking of freelancers, I remember that, in a Dutch project, I had the pleasure of working with a mother tongue translator, with whom I communicated in English for the creation of websites. I was astonished by the fact the following Christmas, I received a handwritten and signed letter in the office, thanking me for our collaboration. This is obviously a very trivial episode, but it makes you wonder upon how business relations and the human side also emerge in an SEO-related work environment, which, in some ways, may seem very detached from our concrete reality. Getting back to the content. In order to help Google understand that your project has contents translated to different languages, there is the famous hreflang tag that specifies the language used on the current web page. By indicating the URLs of all the other translated versions, Google will be able to provide the user with the most appropriate web page based on their language, based on also geolocation, IP, browser preferences, and other data. Link rel equals alternate href equals http colon slash slash example dot com slash en href lang equals es dash mx slash in this example it is clear that the specified url is in spanish but the notation contains two entities language and region for example href lang equals es dash mx refers to spanish in mexico the language format is iso 639-1 while for the region, the ISO 3166-1 Alpha 2 standard is used. In order to avoid mistakes, I often point out for my students that there is no hreflang equals en-uk, but only hreflang equals en-gb. I understand that this is a complex topic, but the main thing to know is that you will have to insert the link rel equals alternate with all the languages in which this page has been translated with the relative URLs in the head section of the web page. We also need to add an hreflang equals x dash default, which will be the main version if the page hasn't a language version for a specific foreign visitor. The hreflang tags, alternative, linguistic version, and canonical, official slash canonical content version, are added to the head section. But remember that, in my opinion, the correct way to make them coexist is only the following. The canonical tag of the Spanish version must point to itself and not to the English version, as I often see in some incorrect implementations.
As for non-HTML files, such as PDF documents, you can specify the language in the HTTP header as follows. Link HTTPS colon slash slash es dot example dot com slash file dash es dot pdf rel equals alternate hreflang equals es or http colon slash slash n dot example dot com slash file dash n dot pdf rel equals alternate hreflang equals en Note that these are only signals for search engines and not obligations and they will be free to either follow them or not at your absolute discretion. I would like to conclude this topic by reassuring you that there are special plugins to simplify the management of multilingual projects. Because manual management, in some cases, is really complex, plus it could and would cause various human errors. Just to give an overall example, consider that in WordPress there are various solutions, but WPML is probably the most frequently used, because it not only allows the management of SEO aspects, but also of operational ones. As you already know, search engines assign a different weight to each backlink. These values determine the trust that your website can benefit from in terms of positioning. Here are some features that help determine the value of a link. Popularity. Having links from many other websites is a positive sign for search engines. Thematic popularity. This refers only to links coming from websites or web pages that deal with similar topics. For example, a bag website would have weightful links from clothing e-commerce websites, but not from a newspaper's website, for example. Anchor text. The visible text of the link may contain one or more thematic keywords. Although in the past it has been an abused technique, obtaining backlinks with relevant anchor text is still very important today. After the Penguin update, it is recommended to also have backlinks with click here, visit the site, brand name, in order to have an even more natural profile. Link Neighborhood If a website has links towards spam websites, then inserts a link to your website, it will not have a particularly positive impact. Social Signals Shares on social networks do not have a strong weight like thematic blog links, but they are taken into consideration by the search engines. Position. A clearly visible link at the top of the page will have a higher impact than a link in the footer. Link Velocity. If your new website gets 100 daily backlinks for a week and then nothing for six months, there's something wrong. You should try to constantly insert links over time. Link Diversity. Having backlinks only from forums or just from blogs is not very natural. You should try to diversify and focus on various typologies such as directories, newspapers, and social networks. When I talk with my students, I notice that they often do like Rocky. I'm not actually talking about Stallone's movie, but about my dog, Rocky. I have a three-year-old border collie, which by nature should work 24 hours a day to gather sheep. Actually, he assists me in SEO activities. He supports me in my work, perhaps more than necessary, and in my spare time, I reward him with some outdoor workout. By nature, Rocky tends to run, be active, and play constantly because he's a dog. SEO is the opposite. It takes time, patience, and we must not push more than necessary because otherwise the risk of penalization is just around the corner. Now, in order to evaluate a backlink or a link building strategy, it is enough to just consider all the points mentioned above holistically because if treated separately, they can be misleading and even incorrect. For example, having a large link popularity, but from spam sites with bad link neighborhoods, would actually be counterproductive. Now, I would like to address the delicate subject of metrics or the numerical values that indicate a link's strength, such as the trust flow, TF, citation flow, CF, domain authority, DA, and many, many others. Surely they can help speed up the work. But be careful. The crawler of these companies, although powerful, will never match Google's power. I often find websites with domain authority, DA, equal to 4 out of 100, simply because the bot had not yet scanned the websites containing important backlinks. In this situation, the DA value is very misleading. By considering it, 
we could risk making the wrong choices. In other situations, they are, instead, useful. For example, finding a blog with citation flow equal to 42 out of 100, but trust flow only 7 out of 100, means that there has obviously been an excessive boost and the risk of having spam links is very high. We remind you that because of the robots.txt file, we can also block these companies' crawlers' access by supplying false and incomplete data in such a way that we can be underestimated by competitors who try to study our metrics. In my opinion, the best solution is to consider various metrics in order to draw a personal conclusion based on experience, because, as we have seen, Basing decisions exclusively on these numbers can be misleading. We're now stepping into the hot topic of natural links, but let me explain what natural links really are, because, reading the various blogs, it looks to be a philosophy of life instead of just a concept. A link is said to be natural when it is obtained without direct intervention through the various link-building practices performed by the SEO professionals. Basically, it is obtained in a natural or automatic way, and this is the reason why these links are the most difficult to obtain and remove. Precisely because they are not under our control, these links could even be harmful to us. Generally, natural links are recognizable because they do not appear on sponsored or paid pages, and they have no tracking parameters, for example, UTM. In theory, these are the only links taken into consideration by Google within its algorithm, and they weigh a lot in determining the ranking and position of each website. From my experience, I fully agree that getting these links is the most effective way to push a website to the top of the search results, but unfortunately it's not always possible. I don't love rhetorical speeches, so I would like to explain the concept for you with some practical examples. How many urban construction blogs exist, at this moment, in Italy? I didn't do any research, but probably about five, I guess. How likely is it that one of these websites notices your article on roof damage after a storm? Probably none. You will be more likely to receive a link from a local newspaper than from them. On the contrary, if you deal with social media marketing strategies, you should know that there are hundreds of blogs on the subject in Italy. It will not be too difficult to get noticed and to get a link if your article is really useful. What I'm trying to say is that in many niche markets, especially in Italy, there aren't enough websites or enough bloggers that could notice your article and decide to insert a link onto their web page. For this reason, in some cases, attracting natural links is certainly impossible, where in others it can happen by chance. But in others yet again, it is extremely difficult and therefore you should be realistic and not even hope for it. After this brief introduction of them, I would like to remind you that natural links are not necessarily good. In fact, in many cases, they come from real spam sites, which can damage your website. In these situations, you can notice it through a manual analysis of your backlinks profile. The full list of backlinks can be found directly within your Google Search Console account. At this point, you should kindly contact the webmaster of these websites in order to request the removal of the link. But if they don't do so, you won't be able to do anything about it, except for the extreme ratio, in the most serious cases, of using the famous disavow tool for telling Google not to consider specific backlinks. But we'll discuss that in a specific chapter. To conclude this chapter, I would like to define outreach as the activity of getting in touch with another webmaster or manager of the target website in order to get backlinks. In addition to guest blogging, I also use the outreach in order to get interesting backlinks by notifying, for example, the webmaster of having broken links or offering a supplementary resource to his text, plus other more advanced practices, which I explain to my students on getseofix.com slash get dash backlinks. Basically, the nofollow links are simple hyperlinks with rel equals nofollow attribute in the HTML code. ahref equals https colon slash slash www.getseofix.com slash page rel equals nofollow. The main purpose is to inform the search engine that it should ignore this link and not transfer the value. In this case, we talk about link juice. 
The opposite is the dofollow rule, or the omission of the tag, because by default, Google considers all links to be followed. The nofollow tag was created to fight comment spam, that is, the practice of leaving comments in blogs by inserting a link to your website in the message. In the past, this had caused problems in the search results. Today, we still find nofollow links in the external links of Facebook posts, YouTube, Wikipedia, and forums. I suggest using the nofollow in these cases. Paid links. Buying links is not prohibited, but if we do it, to avoid penalties, we must use the nofollow attribute. User-generated content. Social networks generally use this attribute because they don't know what people might link to. Links to pages not useful to Google, for example, the pages of a private area. Links to low-quality sites. Comments. WordPress has this option active by default. Getting nofollow links is not useless because they also bring positive effects, including direct traffic, because the average web navigator can follow a link on a web page, regardless of whether it has the nofollow attribute or not. Secondly, from the link diversity point of view, having various nofollow links makes the backlinks profile of our website more natural, considering that not having these would be really suspect. Looking back at 2007, it seemed that most of the SEO activities were reduced to submitting websites to the so-called web directories. Such were real services offered by freelancers, such as submit website to 50 directories in 24 hours, or things like that. A web directory is a portal organized into a large number of categories, where the article or the content is actually made of other websites' reviews. The idea of these portals was to offer the visitor a list of websites that dealt with the same topic. It was really useful at the beginning of the internet when search engines were not so commonly used. Things have changed a little bit today, but let's see exactly what happened. Many of these websites, unfortunately, have been targeted by spammers, with thousands of requests for automatic insertion, and webmasters have had a hard time discriminating legitimate websites from low-quality ones. Precisely for this reason, you can see long queues, with waiting times that can even reach 30 to 60 days. This data discourages those who want to submit their website so they can easily decide to go elsewhere. On the other hand, web directories, famous in the past, have turned into a bunch of spam websites, expired or for adults. By deciding to add your website to these portals, you should especially consider the link neighborhood issue. But then, does it make sense to use directories? If we think about a new website without backlinks, which needs link diversity, then I would say yes. If instead, we talk about a website already affirmed in competitive ranking positions, then I would advise against adding such links, unless a careful research is done in order to find true, good quality web directories. In my opinion, there are still some directories that are worth the wait, but they are actually very far and few, and often, they get closed. Precisely for this reason, I have created a list of these free portals and whose list I keep updated on www.getseofix.com slash directory dash list. If you have never submitted your website to web directories, try to do it on 20 to 50 directories at the most and use different titles and descriptions in order to be original. You will have to choose the most suitable category for your website's theme by looking for the most famous competitors who are already listed in the catalog. Don't be afraid if waiting times range between 30 or 60 days, because in SEO you need to be patient, and getting 30 links in two days on a new website could even be harmful. Nowadays, there are Facebook groups and many other social solutions. But forums continue to exist, although they might not have all the interest and traffic that they had only a few years ago. The great advantage of a forum is being a website focused on a very specific topic, and consequently, having a backlink from these pages can be very relevant for your article. But how do you get links from forums? First, you need to do research in order to find the right forum for your industry. This opens up a rich scenario in terms of opportunities. 
If you deal with asbestos disposal, obviously it will be difficult to find a forum dedicated to this topic, especially in the European market. But you could take advantage of specific sections of a forum about building constructions. After finding one or more forums, you will need to read their rules in order to know two fundamental things. The possibility to insert a signature and the possibility of inserting links within the posts. The first one refers to the footer, which appears at the bottom of your every intervention and which you can customize by entering any text or link. The signature is subjected to the forum's rules, and there may be some limitation depending on the number of written replies or other regulations. Remember that the signature appears in all of your interventions and will always be the same, with a site-wide effect that is omnipresent on various pages. In my opinion, it is not a good move on the SEO side, and in fact I prefer the second option, which we're about to cover now. Replying to someone or directly opening a discussion on the topic treated by your website is a great way to be relevant. Some forums allow you to insert links, non-self-promotional, in the text, with a custom anchor text, and even with a do-follow attribute, thus providing an even greater SEO advantage. Basically, this is a very effective and simple method, but you might encounter some difficulties in finding the right form for your niche, with rules compatible with this practice. As in the rest of the world, the practice of guest blogging has been developing quite a lot in Europe for several years now, and it consists in publishing an article in another person's blog in order to create authority and links. This way, your brand will also be visible to the audience of other websites, thus allowing you to reach an audience that you might not have. The situation is win-win, because everyone wins. The webmaster gets a quality article without doing anything, you get a backlink, and the audience has new content to read about. In practice, the guest post is an article with a section, author box, at the bottom of the article, containing a quick description about you and a bank link, do follow or no follow, to your website. Now, let's talk about the procedure of inserting your post on someone else's blog. During the initial research phase, you will need to find a list of potential target websites that you'd want to ask permission from in order to insert your article. To get started, in addition to sending a message via the form available on the website, you can contact the website owner directly through their LinkedIn profile or other social networks. Another effective method is the direct search for websites that accept this type of collaboration through the following queries. All in quotes, topic, write for us, topic, guest post, topic, authors, and topic, collaborate. After having compiled a list, you should not contact anyone, but make a very precise selection in terms of thematic relevance, first of all. Then check the domain's authority by analyzing, for example, the number of articles, domain age and traffic volumes using Alexa Rank or SEMrush, and some SEO metrics, like domain authority and trust flow. In short, the goal is to find out if we'll receive a link from a legitimate quality website or from a spammer that could damage our site. I don't want to discourage you, but you must know that not everyone will accept and you will have to consider that the real opportunities will be reduced. In a recent campaign of this time, with about 20 European targets, I obtained an approval rate of 70% that I think is excellent. But the variables that come into play are different. Market niche, target type, your reputation, content quality, etc. In many sectors, you can consider yourself lucky if you get 15% of approval, especially in Europe, where there aren't many blogs for each market yet, and talking about guest posts, you often receive phrases like, why should I do free advertising for you? But obviously, they do not understand the meaning of this collaboration. The most common proposal rejection cases in my experience have been the following. A payment is required in order to perceive, 50 to $300, they do not accept guest posts because of the personal ideas, not enough text quality, topic not in line with the type of audience, no answer at all without any explanation. The second phase has to do with contacting the target website by using specific forms or a simple email. 
I suggest writing a concise and straightforward message in order to make the interlocutor understand that the proposed article would be of great quality, at least a thousand words, and unique. You should also include a couple of lines to introduce yourself and wait for the answer within a week. I have inserted the exact text that I use in these messages on getseofix.com slash get dash backlinks. After the initial answer, if it arrives, you should check how and where your backlink will be inserted, with preference for hypertext links with do follow attributes. After making an agreement for the collaboration, you should visit the web page periodically in order to check whether any comments from the public have appeared or not. If so, you will have to respond immediately in order to give the impression of being present and to defend the reputation of your brand, personal or corporate. We have already talked about ROI, return on investment, if you remember. But in this section, we will analyze the key performance indicators, KPIs, which stands for the metrics identifying those objectives that allow us to measure the success of an SEO campaign. How do you know if all your work so far has been effective or not? Not everything is reduced to the position in the search results because having to deal with an entire business with investments and revenues included, we need to have an overview and a structured way of thinking. There are various KPIs available, and each SEO professional has their own preferences. But personally, I stick to the number of visits, ranking position, and number of conversions and bounce rate. I often get requests from potential customers like, I want to double the traffic on my website, or I want to get ranked at the top position. There is nothing wrong with having these desires but it actually means something else in reality. Now, let me explain better. I hate those who do my job incorrectly, making unrealistic promises and playing on the edge of misunderstanding with the client. I believe in the law of karma, so doing harm to someone today, besides being an ethical issue, will certainly bring some problems in the future. On the other hand, working with transparency, in addition to making me sleep peacefully, it also allows me to be proud of each success, to be aware of the failure risks, and it gives me the strength to always go ahead. Precisely for this reason, I preferred to refuse a job rather than accept it, given that in a sector as complex as SEO, there are very few certainties, especially after Rank Brain. I wanted to dedicate a special chapter to objectives, because it is an underestimated issue for people involved in SEO. Number of Visits as you can imagine, the number of visits your website received for free from the search engines, organic traffic, is an important indicator, and therefore we must define it correctly. In Google Analytics, we often cite the term organic sessions, as the visit of the user referred to a time horizon. The timeout is usually 30 minutes. To take a simple example, if the user returned to our website after an hour on the same day, we would have two organic sessions, but only one visit. Beyond the purely technical issues, the number of visits allows us to immediately understand how many people access our website. So, getting an obviously increasing number of visits confirms the success of our SEO efforts. This value is directly influenced by other metrics, such as the location of the snippet within the search results and the CTR or click-through rate. This means that, in order to increase the number of visitors to our website, we can intervene with specific actions to improve these two metrics through the suggestions already seen in prior chapters. Here is an example of my new website's performance, which shows a clear increase in the number of visits. Keyword ranking. To put it simply, the ranking position of your web page in search results for specific keywords greatly influences the number of visitors of the website. You should have noticed that, unlike 5 or 10 years ago, the importance of ranking positions has greatly diminished, and now I'll explain why. A visitor's geolocation, the browser language used by the user, the hours of the day, access from a mobile or desktop device. Considering these factors, the same query term can generate an SERP with completely different results. This is precisely why we should not fossilize on the position as it used to be the right thing to do in the past. We should correctly say and use phrases like, 
I am ranked the fifth by the keyword SEO tools by accessing the web from the desktop at 8 p.m. with a browser in Italian language and using an IP address from Rome. Moreover, you should consider that the fluctuations are constant and a website that is ranked fifth today could be seventh tomorrow and then third. Despite these considerations, I believe that a software that acts as a keyword tracker is still useful in order to get an overall view of your SEO strategy's results, since the main objective is to scale positions after all. Now let me make a joke. Do you know where the mafia hides the bodies? On the second page of Google results, because nobody ever looks there. Beyond the humor, it is true that appearing on the first page in the top three, or better yet, in the first position is definitely a good thing, and it basically translates into having more visitors on your website. We must also consider that not all keywords are equal. Therefore, appearing third for 10 keywords with 50 monthly searches will cause less traffic than being fifth for a keyword of 10,000 searches per month. To conclude these considerations, what really matters in the business is the sales or leads, and that's why the best way to evaluate the keyword ranking is to relate it to conversions, which will be discussed in the next chapter. Here is an example of a position's climb for one of my sites, starting from the 12th to the first position. Although it is not a keyword with large volumes, it has a very good conversion rate, and this is why I decided to focus on its ranking positioning. Number of leads and conversions. If, so far, we have seen two KPIs that operate directly on attracting the public towards our website, now we will move on to a topic that is often mistreated by those involved in SEO, and especially by those who are not familiar with marketing. What do we actually expect the user to do after landing on our web pages? Evidently, an action of some kind is desired a purchase, registration, a quote request, social shares, or an email opt in. At this point, we are getting closer to marketing concepts than to SEO. First, not all actions performed are equal, especially in terms of value. For example, a 40% increase in shares on social networks is a good sign, but it would be even better if it were in sales. Remember that leads and conversions can come from various keywords related to very different buyer intents. For example, the first position for LGK4 price will probably lead to many more conversions than LGK4, although the second keyword has more traffic volume than the first. The message is clear. We cannot live on traffic alone, but in addition to choosing the appropriate keywords for our goal, the conversion rate must also be considered. We should be doing the so-called conversion rate optimization, CRO, which includes work on the interface, content, calls to action, and above all, includes the sales funnel developed by the marketing department. Bounce rate. If you love definitions, the bounce rate is a percentage value that represents the ratio between the sessions where the user immediately exits without taking any action on the web page and the total number of sessions. It is no secret that there has been speculation on this value for years, and even today we talk about it, precisely because it is a good indicator for evaluating the user experience on the pages of each website. One thing to keep in mind is that it is not always accurate, so we must be careful. First of all, there is no correct or optimal value, because keywords respond to different needs and market niches are multiple. For example, if I am looking for how to say yellow in Italian after opening a web page and finding giallo, why should I stay on that website any longer? Having had my request solved already, I can leave, but I leave satisfied. Actually, in this case, if we want to be picky, if the website had a bad interface, not showing the translation immediately, I would be forced to visit other internal links, thus improving the bounce rate of the page, but I'd be coming out frustrated for not having found the answer. Now, this does not mean that the bounce rate is useless or makes no sense, but like many other SEO concepts, it must be contextualized according to the web page type. Now, let's see in detail how exactly it should be contextualized. Inside a sales funnel, if the cart page has a bounce rate of 90%, something is obviously wrong. In this case, 
working on the graphical interface might obtain a 30% bounce rate and would be a great success. On the other hand, having a bounce rate of 95% on the thank you page after entering the email address is perfectly normal and it would make no sense to waste time on it. Other cases where the bounce rate is relevant. When you know the bounce rates for a competitor for the same keywords, after a substantial intervention on the layout or on the contents. In these situations, it is very important to make sure that a drop in terms of bounce rate does not occur. Here is an example of my legal theme site with a very interesting bounce rate. As you know, this value is generally different depending on the source of traffic. My concept is very simple. If a website already has great rankings, Google obviously likes it because it does something better than my website. From this small consideration, in the SEO field we use phrases like spying on competitors or studying competition, or other similar formulas. Since you probably operate in a niche where there are already other players, there are standards you can follow to optimize your site and even do something better than they do. For example, if you have a blog and the top 10 results have articles with 800 words, you probably wouldn't be able to compete with only 350, and you'll want to reach 800 or even 1,200 words. If the top 5 results have 50 backlinks with page authority, or PA, of 50 over 100, obviously you already know that it will be very difficult to overcome them, and you will have to organize yourself accordingly perhaps with an important and particularly onerous link-building strategy. What I want to tell you is that studying what others are already doing can really give you lots of information to help you choose which strategies or individual optimizations you should do on your site. For example, you may find that your title tag is 90 characters long and needs to be corrected by making it shorter, since your best competitor's tag has 65 characters. Instead, you could also check your strengths, such as the fact that your site is much faster to load than others. In short, a comparison of this type gives you a really interesting overview. Page Analysis Tools If you follow the best practices to do SEO on your site, are you 100% sure that everything is perfect? We are all human and some error, oversight, or forgetfulness can always happen and it is precisely for this reason that both for new and mature projects, it is essential to verify the SEO of a page. For example, on getseofix.com slash site dash analysis, I offer a manual SEO analysis service to create a very detailed PDF report with strengths and things to improve on, thanks to specific suggestions and explanations. Here are just some of the points I consider during a serious SEO analysis. The domain, usability, content, on-page technical analysis, backlinks, keywords, competition, and action plan. Although there are dozens of automated tools for the SEO analysis of a website, unfortunately these evaluation services do not allow you to go deep into the problems. This means that various problems are discovered only with the experience of those people who have done this work every day. There is great interest in page speed because this feature of the site is directly involved in determining the user experience. Also, in a direct or indirect way, it is seriously taken into account by the Google algorithm. Now, loading speed depends on a myriad of technological factors, but I would still like to give you the set of methods which I generally apply. First of all, what is a good loading speed? Google loves the TTFB, time to first byte, which corresponds to the time required to get the first byte, since the user's browser makes a request to the server. Best practices set this optimal value to a maximum of 0.2 seconds. As you may have noticed, this is a value very different from the total loading time of the page, because it only refers to the responsiveness of the server. Obviously, Google also considers the rest, because that is what is directly involved in the user experience. 
For a total page loading time, you can use online measurement tools, such as Pingdom or GT Metrics, rendering included. In my sites, I tend to stay in the range of 1 to 2 seconds, considering these elements. The server response to show the page, JavaScript dependencies and CSS style sheets, images, fave icon, an iframe, for example a YouTube video. Now, let's see in practice what are the most useful tasks to speed up a site, considering that some will be particularly technical, while others are for everyone. GZIP compression. This reduces the size of HTML and CSS and JavaScript dependencies. To enable it, enter a specific code in the .ht access file of your hosting. Images. Compress the files with external software, like TinyPNG, or apply the practice of lazy loading. Minification. Removing spaces, commas, and other useless characters from the style sheets, JavaScript, and HTML help to reduce the size of the data to be transferred. You'll find several free tools or WordPress plugins, like WP Fastest Cache. Browser Cache. By visiting 10 or 20 pages, the user's browser can download the JS and CSS files locally in order to not have to continually request them from the server. In order to enable this functionality, you will need to enter a specific code in the .ht access file of your hosting. Server Cache I refer to Varnish, WordPress plugin like Comet Cache, or other server-side solutions to save every page and make it immediately available to the user when it gets requested, without having to continually generate it from scratch. Multiple redirects I often see some pages with a series of 301 redirects, but you need to know that, in addition to diluting the link juice, they take time and the sum of all these times can result in a long, unjustified wait for the user. Type of server Based on the number of visitors and the type of content, you can do all the optimizations you want, but a shared hosting could still be inadequate and you will need to switch to a VPS or even a dedicated server with exclusive resources to better manage the requests of your visitors. Technology It is evident that using WordPress, Joomla, or other CMS will be much heavier than a pure HTML site in terms of loading time. The architecture choice has a significant impact on response times, regardless of the type of server you have. Updates Technology advances and new versions tend to be optimized. For example, in a recent benchmark made by Kinsta.com, it has been verified that with WordPress 5, having PHP 7.3 offered significantly better performance, with 253.2 requests per second, compared to the classic PHP 5.6, with 91.64 requests per second, which is still used in many servers. Obviously, we need to evaluate the deprecated functions and compatibility of plugins or other scripts, but it is certainly worth considering. So far, we have seen technical optimizations, which should be done only at the end, but we have other equally effective implementations to apply from the beginning of a project. Light themes. When you choose graphics, you should opt for a small and fast loading template, otherwise you'll have a hard life trying to optimize it later. Limit the plugins. If you use WordPress, from the beginning you should try to activate only the plugins that you really need, or you could merge them together. For example, instead of using three plugins for social sharing functionalities, just check if there is only one that already does everything. Restrict media. It is important to use images or multimedia content in the pages, but it is equally important not to overdo it. For example, including 50 photos in a solar panel cost is obviously excessive and would only slow down the page loading. The same goes for YouTube video embeds, since uploading 20 videos on one page doesn't make much sense. Remove unnecessary dependencies. When you remove some features from the template you just bought, it happens to still have references to CSS and JS files, which only take up resources and slow down loading time. In this case, you should proceed to remove them from the HTML code.
One of the concepts that is rarely discussed in the SEO world is the term crawl budget. That is, a value that represents the number of pages that a search engine scans on a site, generally with reference to 24 hours. Since Google does not like to waste resources of its servers, it will prefer to spend its time and performance to scan content that it believes to be of quality. Evidently, Googlebot will assign a larger crawl budget to a site that it likes, while it will reduce it in the case of spam or problematic websites. So how do you increase the crawl budget? Trust. If we get new quality links to the site, we will increase the general trust towards our content, and we will be more taken into consideration. Update of content. If a site is constantly updated with new articles or with modifications to existing ones, frequent scans will be necessary to keep up with the updates. Upload speed. If the server responds quickly to the bot, in a fixed time it can scan more pages than in a slower site. In order to view the pages crawled by Googlebot, you can see the charts directly in your Google Search Console account, discovering the number of pages visited daily, the bandwidth used, and the loading speed. Looking at these charts, you will be able to tell if it is the case to upgrade the server resources or take another action to improve the accessibility to your site. I personally believe that crawl budget is a concept to be known, but with some clarifications. Referring to e-commerces or larger sites with thousands of pages, real indexing problems can be treated, especially with a frequent update of products, prices, and variants. In these cases, the crawl budget must be taken into consideration to ensure that all sections of the site are indexed and checked periodically. On the other hand, whoever has a blog with 100 pages will probably never suffer from these problems, but can just monitor the situation to make sure that all the pages are equally scanned and everything is correct. So far, we have talked about aggregated data, but how do we know what specific pages or categories of the site are scanned? For this purpose, we are helped by log files, which we will see in the next chapter. We already know that your site receives requests from users and robots to access content, but how do we analyze all this traffic in detail? In addition to tools such as Google Analytics, which monitors human users, there are the so-called log file analyzer tools. We are talking about the special files generated by the server, which contain the list of requests received with date, IP address, time, path, user agent, and other useful information according to the W3C consortium format. For each new request to the server, a line will be written inside the log file, and, day after day, these records will accumulate to be analyzed. The insertion is progressive and consequently the last access will be found at the bottom. Based on your hosting specifications, such as Apache, Nginx, IIS, etc., the path will be different. As you may have noticed, if your site is particularly visited, you may have log files with thousands of lines, and, in this case, it would be very complex to do a manual analysis. To facilitate you in this operation, there are specific softwares specifically designed for this purpose, such as integrations of Elasticsearch, which respond to the needs of an enterprise, or Get SEO Fix Log Analyzer for a more handy use that you can find on getseofix.com slash log dash analyzer. But what is the purpose of these tools? Well, security, bug fixing, correcting technical malfunctions, and SEO analysis. In terms of security, it is important to monitor all received requests so that we can find out malicious bots that visit hundreds of pages a day, pages visited that do not exist, accesses to private pages, and elements identifying intrusion attempts. After discovering these accesses, we can decide to block them to cover security holes or simply to prevent malicious bots from indexing our site and using our resources. The block can be executed via the robots.txt file or with rules in the firewall for the user agent. On the other hand, the log files also tell us how Googlebot accesses our pages and how it proceeds with crawling operations. Let's see some practical examples of what we could discover through the logs. The number of requests in a period of time indicates the average load for the server. 
error codes 404 and 503. If we find that there are many errors, we should do a technical action or upgrade the server. Dates from the last crawl. How often does the bot visit us? The most visited pages for Googlebot. They are particularly appreciated content. Which pages or areas of the site are never visited? We should discover why and improve these sections to get better results. And waste of the crawl budget. If the bot visits dozens of useless pages, duplicated or with little value, it will not have enough crawl budget to index new content or view the updates of really important sections. After identifying this data, we will be able to proceed by making optimizations to facilitate Google's crawl, perhaps thinking about the structure of internal links, or making other improvements, and then checking if something has changed. Here is an example of a recent log file belonging to one of my sites about health. You will notice that there are hundreds of hits by famous SEO analysis bots. I could decide to block them to save server resources or simply not allow them to offer interesting data to my competitors. If you remember, in the past, slogans of the SEO agencies said, we will take you to the top positions, or at least on the front page. Today, things have changed because it is possible to go even higher. Above 1, there is 0, and this is why we speak of position 0. I refer to the so-called featured snippets, that is, a sort of promoted organic result that appears above all the others. This snippet is very special because it can contain a title, URL, images, tables, or other elements. Its function is to show an answer to the user's question directly on the search page since Google already has all the contents in its index and it is able to process and present them immediately, with a link to the source. This does not happen for all search queries, but only in some cases, and often when it comes to particular questions or topics. For its graphic appearance and size, it is certainly a result that is more noticeable than all the others. Some might think that showing the answer already in the SERP almost seems like a content theft, but actually, some U.S. case studies have shown that CTR does not change so much, and it may even increase. Users are now used to their presence, as they appear more and more often on Google Pages, and they will probably remain forever. You must be wondering, how do you get featured snippets for your pages? Position. You must already be on the first page, because you don't see featured snippets of results on the second page or beyond. Answer. Your post should contain, among the various contents, the factual answer to a question. For example, how much is X? Title with questions. The title should start with why, how much, how, who, when, where, or what. Contents. Use tables, lists, and various headings. By creating new articles following these rules, you could get a privileged space and be really visible to the visitors. These are not widespread, but you should know that site links are an additional section directly integrated into the snippet of your result in an SERP, and it consists of a series of links with descriptions. This sort of navigation menu is designed by Google to help the user in choosing the pages to visit of a site, and this is why site links generally appear on the home page and not on internal pages. These links may include static pages, categories, or other content directly chosen by Google. We now have no choice, unlike some time ago, when the Demote Site Link setting still existed on the Google Search Console. How do we get these site links? Get the first position for your brand. The impact in the search results is evident for keywords related to your brand, making it stand out from other results and offering the user various pages to choose from as they may not want to visit the home page, but another section. Structure the navigation. Having a sitemap, breadcrumbs, categories in a menu, and a good internal linking structure will facilitate the Googlebot crawl to understand exactly how the site is structured. Trust. It is rare to find site links in a newly created site. You will need to attract quality links to improve the authority of the site and get it seriously considered by Google. There is also the search box site link, 
which is an interactive search bar directly on the Google SERP, which will immediately take you to the page of your site with a search result for the user query term. This allows you to take advantage of the internal search engine on your site and send the user to the correct page without wasting time. In order to enable it, you will need to insert a special markup in JSON-LD or microdata format to provide Google with some useful data to correctly use your internal search engine. You could, however, get this feature automatically, but remember you can always disable it by entering, in the head section, the following meta tag. Meta name equals Google, content equals no site links search box. If you decide to create a new blog to do content marketing and to publish content, you will need to bear in mind some key points to avoid wasting your time. Thanks to my personal experience, I am increasingly convinced of the importance of these 10 principles, and I often suggest them to my students as well. Think about your target. If in the past it made sense to do keyword cannibalization and create hundreds or thousands of posts to target different keywords, Today, this trick doesn't quite work so well, and it makes sense to focus on a few but quality articles, to talk about a topic in the best way and sincerely help the visitors. Editorial Plan I advise against improvising and writing articles as the day go by. Initially, you should do a title research and then plan exactly when to write and when to publish. Link Building Try to create relationships with other bloggers in your niche in order to publish guest posts and get links to your best articles. Over-optimization Do not obsess yourself on the scores given by various SEO plugins, such as Yoast SEO, because it is useless to have scores of 100 out of 100 if this activates penalties. Technology When it comes to blogs, in 90% of cases we talk about WordPress, because it is the most widespread and used platform. There are other more performing solutions or made for specific needs, but in most cases WordPress is more than enough, both in SEO and functionality, perhaps with some special plugins. Structure Think very well about the categories, and if you used a siloing structure, try to write perfectly relevant titles. For example, if you don't have a news website, I would avoid showing the dates in the SERP snippet. Niche Topic Unless it is a generalist blog, you should focus on a specific niche to become the expert in that sector. For example, in an ORCID blog, it would be off-topic to talk about how to grow catnip. Branding To push your personal brand, use your first and last name or a pseudonym in the About Me section or directly in the title tag in all the pages of the site. Attention to Configurations Avoid duplicate content and pay attention to the author, archive, and date pages using the MetaRobots method or with a canonical link tag. Don't forget to manage 404 pages from your Google Search Console account, and in case of repeated 503 errors, consider changing servers or upgrading current resources. Graphics Although many are obsessed about graphics, I am now convinced that any light and modern template is perfect given that the real discriminator lies in the content and in the user experience, certainly not in the refinement of the design unless this is precisely the topic of the blog. These are the main recommendations that I would like to give to anyone who wants to improve a blog, but I also want to emphasize that all other concepts already explained in this book are always valid. I would like to add an eleventh point because it is really important and many tend to ignore it. If in the past, Publishing a post meant pressing the publish button and the game was done. Today, we can and must devote extra time for the promotion, but let's see how. If we have profiles on social networks, we should share our posts with followers, notify newsletter subscribers, and make sure to inform the highest number of people about each piece we publish. In this way, we will attract social signals, but also some backlinks, instead of hoping someone will notice us and decide to give us a backlink. Here are the volumes of traffic obtained from one of my blogs about numismatics, entirely built in WordPress. Beyond SEO, I personally believe that having a blog today is a great idea for content marketing. Although there are many of them, people are always looking for quality information, 
and it is thanks to a blog that we have the opportunity to make ourselves known. Don't forget that the visibility that Google offers us by doing a well-designed SEO allows us to offer our content to the visitors and indirectly the references and solutions of our products or services. Perhaps it is not obvious, but I assure you that doing SEO on an e-commerce site is not like working on a blog, because there are so many differences and the approach itself must be different. An online store will probably have many products to offer, considering the variants, the models, and other peculiarities. It could have 100, 1,000, or even more pages, organized in dozens of categories and sublevels. Let's see how to generally proceed to do SEO on an e-commerce site. A. Keyword Research It is not obvious that the name of a product does not always match with the same keyword that people know. For example, if you sell an object that you know as pool bag, you may find that many customers call it swimming bag. In short, these are different ways to identify the same object. Perhaps for this reason, a research for keywords will be necessary before proceeding to write the contents. The same thing goes for the organization in categories, since we often see commercial terms, which are known by a small number of potential customers. This is an example of a missed opportunity to attract qualified traffic on very important pages for an e-commerce site. To understand how your customers talk, in addition to already knowing the market, you can already study your competitors by looking at the organization of their site and using the same keywords, which otherwise you would not have discovered. Talking about volumes, you need to consider that some keywords have obvious seasonal relevance. For example, Christmas sweaters in winter, or hidden, for example, dog food in winter. Another fundamental thing to consider is the commercial intent. This differentiates queries that express a desire to buy a product from those related to mere curiosity. For example, the best sweaters versus how to make a sweater. You will be able to verify this concept by looking at the competition of advertisers on Google Ads, considering that if a keyword is not monetizable, not many advertisers are willing to bid on an auction to win visitors. B. Site Structure If you need to manage thousands of pages, it is important to make sure that the user does not click or browse dozens of posts in order to view the product of their interest. For this reason, we talk about the rule of three, because every page should be reachable in a maximum of three clicks from the home page. We are talking about the perfect case to do a siloing structure. This means to organize categories by topic and insert sublevels to contain closely related products. C. Content Optimization As for on-page optimization, you could use some tricks. Title tag. For example, use words like discount, buy, etc. Meta description. For example, refer to free shipping. Body. Try to include images of alternative text and an exhaustive description of the product with all possible details, including the most relevant keywords. URL. Include the keywords in the structure of the categories in the URL. For example, .it slash woman dash dresses slash night dash shirt. Internal links. The most important pages of the site should have a link to the leading products to improve their visibility and authority. Rich Snippet. If you show reviews, you could implement a markup to get stars for greater visibility on Google Pages. D. Link Building. Creating a good backlinks profile for an e-commerce site is certainly different from a blog, because it is not easy for a newspaper or other blogs to decide to mention a page of your product and give you customers as a gift. Precisely for this reason, in order to promote an online store, Different approaches are used, often oriented to the use of internal and formative sections, like guides or tutorials on related topics, to attract natural links and distribute the value to important pages through an appropriate linking structure. For example, a cycling shop could create a section with guides dedicated to cleaning the bicycle by using videos and tutorials, which can be easily shared and could attract various backlinks, even from authoritative sites. E. Common e-commerce issues. Managing thousands of pages that are frequently updated, e-commerce sites have delicate points to work with. Crawl budget. 
As explained in the appropriate chapter, check if some sections of the site are not crawled. If there are pages that waste budget and after your fixes, make sure that Googlebot can correctly visit the site. Duplicate content. Magento and other platforms may generate duplicate content, especially with a filter menu, to specify variants, prices, or other features. Check if these situations exist, then take action with canonicalization, robots no index, or directly remove duplicated pages. Speed. If the site is slow, you will lose visitors and Google will certainly not reward you. Invest in caching solutions or upgrade the server. Original content. Try to write unique and original descriptions for each product, not limiting yourself to a couple of lines, but using various thematic keywords to improve the content relevance. Out of stock. You may decide to show a 404 error page, customized with a search box to not lose the user or just show the correct page with a purchase box disabled. Responsive. Also consider the experience for mobile devices, especially analyzing the bounce rate in delicate pages, such as the shopping cart or checkout. At the technological level, the platforms of the moment are Shopify, PrestaShop, and Magento. The last one is equipped with various extensions, and I know it personally since 2008, although I must say that it often needs optimizations in terms of loading speed. If you have already run a campaign with Google Ads, previously Google AdWords, you will know what landing pages are and why they are important in an SEM, Search Engine Marketing, strategy. In a nutshell, it is a page where we send traffic. Generally, we tend to optimize it to obtain a good conversion rate through specific forms and calls to action in order to make sure the user takes some action. Many sites need to focus on one or more landing pages to generate sales or leads within their business strategy, and that's why you need to know how to treat them in the best way. At this point, planning the structure and the content, a dilemma may arise. Is it better to focus on organizing for SEO or for conversions? In the case of an SEO orientation, you should prefer content that contains many relevant keywords. There will also be internal links to various resources to lower the bounce rate and distribute the link juice to other pages on the site. Conversely, a conversion-oriented job, perhaps because the page is the subject of PPC campaigns at the same time, must leverage the user's attention. This means that this page should contain less text and avoid inserting links that could disperse the attention. The target audience is already qualified and very restricted in order to encourage actions. You shouldn't target keywords that are too general or inappropriate to convert. The choice of the right approach for your project may not be so clear, and it's very common to prefer an intermediate solution, using some characteristics from one and others from another. Going even further in practice when you need to improve a landing page, you should follow these steps. Keyword search. You need to find the keywords that exactly match the content of the page in order to have high conversion rates. Link building. Try to get quality backlinks to this page, but also to the others to which this post is directly linked. In this way, you will have a much more natural backlink profile without having 100% links to a single internal page, which would seem very artificial. CTR, click-through rate. To improve this metric and consequently the traffic that will come to the page, you could improve title tags and meta descriptions, by inserting a call to action or adding rich snippets if the topic is adequate. Above the fold. This concept simply means that the most important content, and maybe a call to action, must be visible at the top of the page, because many users often decide to leave before even scrolling the page. This does not mean that you always need a content of 100 words, but simply that the top part must be the most interesting. Speed. Needless to say that if we did SEO or spend money to bring traffic to a page, this must load quickly to avoid wasting all of our efforts. It is possible to serve a cached version of the landing page because many times it contains static content only. Depending on the project, some speed optimizations could be performed only on this page, but not on the rest of the site. For example, combining CSS or JS dependencies, disabling irrelevant plugins, etc.
I have noticed that in the last few years, even small companies are taking an interest in ranking themselves on search results pages, probably because the number of local searches is growing and in the United States it is equal to 46% compared to the total searches. The so-called local SEO is a series of practices to rank a snippet related to geolocation in SERPs, for example, by entering the name of a city in the search query. There is also a growing number of searches related to near me, such as restaurant near me or synonyms. Now, in order to appear in these situations, you certainly don't have to put near here or other formulas in your pages because it would make no sense and it immediately looks to be an over-optimization. Considering the local opportunity, the need to be found arises for hotels, doctors, lawyers, restaurants, and many other professionals operating in a specific city or region. In the local SERPs, there is a part dedicated to the classic search results and another called Local Snack Pack, which includes some relevant commercial activities with reference to Google Maps. To get started, you need to have a Google My Business account, formerly Google Places, and proceed to optimize your business listing, entering all the required information, including business description, category, check the competitors, photographs, opening hours, address, and contacts. Google's local results algorithm works on three main factors. Relevance. How relevant is your company with a user search? Distance. How far is your company from the location used in the search? Evidence. How famous is your company? To determine the evidence, Google considers any backlinks, number, and positivity of reviews. Consider that most local searches are done on mobile devices, such as smartphones and tablets, probably because people do these searches when they are already outside of their home. How to optimize your site for local searches. City name. Enter it in the title tag, in the meta description, in the H1, and also in the body. Structured data. Enter the local business markup in JSON-LD to have your pages in the famous NAP, name, address, and phone number, considering it must contain the same data already entered on your Google My Business listing. Map. Embed the Google Map showing the location of your business in the city. Local citations. When your business is mentioned entirely with the NAP, it is a relevant signal taken into consideration by Google. You can enter your business details in various directories, such as Yelp and TripAdvisor. Reviews. As you cannot write reviews for yourself, try to invite your customers to leave feedback on their experience using your services. I would like to focus on the last point because it plays a fundamental role in the current algorithm, and it should therefore be exploited to the maximum. As this is not a customer care or marketing guide, I will simply point out that you should consider the following in relation to customer reviews. Ask for them. Many customers are satisfied and don't leave a review because they don't know it is possible or they forget to do it. Make sure you invite them to write a comment about their experience. Always reply. Whether it's a positive or negative opinion, it's always a good idea to answer to increase your presence and show people that you care about your customers. Negative reviews. It is true that they can damage your reputation, but you can use a few tools to appeal in very serious cases or just apologize in order to try to win back the customer. Constant improvement. Having 50 reviews with an average of two stars is a problem, but having all five stars may not be achievable. You should always look to improve the current situation, considering that any value greater than four is an excellent result, and the more you get, the better. Not everyone knows that the second most used search engine is not Yahoo, and not even Bing, but YouTube. Obviously, the results are videos and not web pages. Nowadays, more and more companies are focusing on visual content marketing, and instead of publishing website pages containing videos to rank on Google, it is worthwhile to create a YouTube channel and publish content directly there. Beyond influencers and other people who use YouTube to generate entertainment traffic, even small businesses can benefit from a strategy related to YouTube with a good optimization of their videos. The type of search on YouTube can be different from Google because when the user searches for a video, 
he could use keywords that are different from the ones he would use to read an article. And that's why data offered by the Google Keyword Planner tool is not so interesting, although it may be useful to get a general idea. An effective way to do SEO on YouTube videos is to follow this procedure. Title. Enter the main keyword in the video title. Description. Use the keywords in the video description. Tags. You can use the LSI keywords or search for video tags of competitors, no longer from the meta keywords tag, but within the script in the source code of the YouTube page. Engagement. Encouraging users to leave likes and comments offers important signals to the algorithm to better consider your content. Subscribe button. Although now there is also a bell to activate, the subscriber button lets you alert your subscribers about new videos as soon as they are published. Quality. You can use a professional or homemade set, but remember that for a good video two things are essential, lights and audio. Make sure that you invest in good equipment, such as lamps for the three-point lighting, and a good microphone, hidden on the shirt or in areas close to the body. Thumbnail. The preview image is very important because it directly affects the percentage of clicks on your video compared to competitors. Try to use colors in contrast to the rest and maybe include keywords or facial expressions that invite visitors to open your result. Subtitles. Inserting the captions of the video contents, besides helping users in understanding, will have a positive effect in terms of SEO, since it helps the YouTube algorithm to better analyze the content and the key words pronounced in the audio of the video. File name. Use a relevant file name. Unlike video1.mp4, you should upload hydraulico-roma.mp4. Share. In addition to sharing your YouTube videos on social networks, you could also embed them on your website or try to get backlinks from other platforms. Duration. In addition to keeping the user's attention high, the ideal duration for each video should be between 5 and 10 minutes. Soon, I will also explain to you why. Playlists. Organize videos by topic and insert them in special thematic playlists in order to increase the relevance of the content as if they were real website categories. We must also consider that YouTube measures the user experience when viewing your video. By playing the movie directly on its platform, the software is able to collect a myriad of data. In particular, the metric of the watch time is important, and it means how many minutes have been viewed by your users. Obviously, if you produce 30-second videos, this value will necessarily be very low. It is necessary to know how to interpret these numbers, because, unlike the famous YouTubers that generate millions of views for a single video, we address ourselves not to the mass, but to a very specific and very limited audience. This means that even making a few thousand views per video may be a great success. For example, here is the watch time of my YouTube channel focused on people interested in WordPress in Italy. The other important value is the audience retention. This term refers to the various metrics related to how the video has been viewed, like what percentage is usually viewed compared to the total duration. If your video was watched for 30% of the total duration, you should obviously consider whether it is a topic or communication problem. In this situation, you could insert pattern interruption to keep up the attention. These reports offer you very important statistics and data to become aware of all the improvements that you can implement in the next videos in order to offer a better user experience and obtain higher positions in the YouTube search results. Lastly, don't forget that most of the traffic on YouTube comes from related videos. I refer to the section of suggested results that are shown directly on the pages of your competitors. I remind you that Google's primary goal is to show its visitors the best possible results for their search. To achieve this, Google has implemented a very sophisticated algorithm. Despite all possible efforts, there are and there will always be many flaws. Precisely for this reason, Big G has developed punishments for those who play without following the rules and exploit these loopholes to get higher rankings without deserving them. There are two macro categories of penalties, and many still confuse them today. Manual. A team of people monitors the internet to see if anyone is cheating. If so, a sanction will be applied. 
for example, a loss of positions and, in the most serious cases, even the de-indexation of the entire site. Remember that in this case, in the Google Search Console account, you will be notified and can submit a reconsideration request. Algorithmic The algorithm updates are not real penalties because they are simple rule changes, which cause a preference for sites that were previously less considered and a drop for others who, on the other hand, were highly appreciated. In this case, there is no possibility to request a reconsideration, but you will have to directly modify the site to adapt it to the new algorithm update. The most common situations considered by Google are unnatural backlinks to or from your site, paid and without rel equals nofollow, site victim of hacking. Hackers could modify pages or upload entire folders of irrelevant content for the sole purpose of damaging you. Cloaking. Show the user a different page version from the one provided to Google. Low-quality content or spam. Text that is self-generated or copied from other sources. Keyword stuffing. The insertion of keywords everywhere in the page to over-optimize it. Google updates consist of changes to the algorithm in order to achieve very specific objectives. In recent history, those who played a predominant role have always had an animal or similar name. The most significant, to date, have been Panda in February of 2011. It targeted duplicate content and low-quality sites. Top Heavy in January of 2012. It hit sites with excessive banners and advertisements, which are detrimental to the user experience. Penguin, April of 2012. It involved sites with aggressive link building, over-optimization of anchor text, and other practices. Pirate, August 2012. It limited the positions of sites that had received various DMCAs, copyright infringement reports. EMD, September 2012. It prevented low-quality sites from reaching high positions just because they had exact keywords in the domain name. Payday, June 2013. It had cleaned up the search results from these spammy queries, such as Viagra, pornography, and others. Hummingbird, September of 2013. It improved the relevance of a query with the content of a page. Instead of applying the match only to one or more words, the relevance was of the entire search query. Pigeon, July of 2014. It was an update to improve local searches, introducing the concept of territorial distance into the algorithm. Mobile Friendly, April 2015. It was developed to push pages optimized for accessibility by mobile devices. RankBrain, October 2015. An artificial intelligence was implemented to understand the relationships between words and measure the user experience. Fred. March of 2017. It hit sites that favored monetization over the user experience. There are many others, such as, for example, the Medic update of August 2018, which gave a boost to authoritative sites in various vertical sectors, such as the medical one. Here is what happened at the end of April of 2012 with the arrival of the Penguin update to one of my sites with a female topic. I would like you to note the immediate drop from one day to the next, going from about 3,500 to 700 daily visits. When we hear about the release of a new Google update, which modifies the correct algorithm, we can only adapt to the news by reading SEO blogs and trying to re-obtain past rankings. In this case, you will not be notified by anyone, and technically it is only a change, not a specific punishment for your site. Manual penalties instead refer to manual actions applied by a Google team member, Quality Rater, towards your site. You'll notice this because you'll receive a notification in your Google Search Console account with some details. But how do these human beings really notice your site among millions of other sites? Obviously, Google has automated internal systems to provide lists of suspected cases to its collaborators, but there are also specific features, such as Spam Report, which allows any user to send a notification to Big G when discovering someone who plays dirty, like an unfair competitor. In the unfortunate event you have already received a manual action against your web property, you have probably already read one of the following reasons. 
misleading structured data. Some pages may have improperly used the markup technique by showing different data in the visible text and the JSON-LD code. Unnatural links From or to your site. For example, by participating in link schemes or practices such as exchanging or buying links without rel equals no follow. User spam. Some users may post links inside spam comments in a blog. Hidden text or keyword stuffing. These are over-optimizations of the page to deceive Google. Cloaking. The page shown to Google is different from the page viewed by users. And low-quality content. Pages with no added value, automatically generated, or containing copied content. In many cases, the cause of a penalty is due to our aggressive approach, which aims to over-optimize the pages or to get backlinks by force. Other times, it can happen to be victims of negative SEO attacks, because although Google takes these cases into account, sometimes these attacks are successful. If the cause is a sudden acquisition of spam backlinks, you may need to use a disavow tool in your Google Search Console account to remove all malicious incoming links and wait for the situation to be restored by sending a reconsideration request with details about the actions taken. At this point, you might be wondering how do you know for sure if and when your site has been really affected by the new algorithm or by a penalty? The most effective way, in my opinion, is the verification of positions for various keywords. If you notice a sudden drop for these values in the same period, you should take immediate action to solve the situation. On the other hand, there are also many false positives, because a new competitor may have outcome many of your previous positions. After verifying that your site has been subjected to a manual action or an algorithm update, you will have to perform some activities to resolve the situation. For example, the hateful case of unnatural links is often highlighted by finding many backlinks with spammy anchor texts. In a situation of normality, most anchor texts should be like, click here, visit the site, or branded as, on my brand. To try to resolve this over-optimization, you should contact all the webmasters of the linking sites, kindly asking them to remove these backlinks and, in the worst case scenario, you will have to use the disavow tool, uploading the complete list of these domains. As you may have guessed, these are difficult situations to deal with, but following the guidelines, there are excellent chances of recovering past positions, even if revenue not obtained in the meantime is lost forever. This often undermines the reputation of a site, and it happens that discouraged webmasters decide to abandon the project, seeing no solution. Precisely for this reason, it is important to check the history of the domain you want to register for your next project especially by analyzing the backlinks. If, unfortunately, you choose a deleted domain, which in the past was penalized and still has active spam links, you could inherit many problems that would remain forever. Real example of manual penalization with resolution. Working in this sector for over 10 years, you can imagine that I was personally affected by these changes, and so it was. The approach must always be professional, we must not take it personally, because there is a solution or a way to fix it, which will allow us to recover lost positions. Yes, as you will have understood if you are hit by a manual penalty, it is a great problem because your website disappears from usual positions, the traffic drops and, in the case of a business, you will notice a decline in revenue. It's not a good situation and I don't wish it on anyone, but in this sector it can happen and I would like to tell you what happened to me and what I did to get out of it, recovering the traffic that I had in the past. I refer to a site that I didn't consider very much, and fortunately it didn't have the particular influence on my business revenue, but it was, however, an issue to be solved as soon as possible. After I suddenly received a notification inside my Google Search Console account with references to a manual action, I started to get worried. First of all, I opened my site to check for any hacks or other incorrect practices, but after some analysis I didn't find anything relevant, and so I thought it was my fault. I decided to modify the home page by inserting a couple of images, increasing the spaces between the lists of articles, and enlarging the fonts of the links to be better usable by mobile. After that, I opened some internal pages to apply similar optimizations to the user interface, UI. Finally, 
I prepared a detailed answer for Google, informing them of the operations I applied to meet their warning and to prove my willingness to follow their rules. At this point, I could only wait and hope that the manual reviewer could understand that the site was legitimate and it had nothing wrong. And so it was because, within a few days, I received a positive response. There was nothing left for me to do but only waiting to see the results. As you can see from the statistics below, there was a clear and sudden recovery in a short time. At the end of this bad experience, I can say that I was lucky. I managed to solve it in a few days, but many colleagues do not get out of it and it becomes a real nightmare for them. This is one of the reasons why I do not recommend, even to my students, to follow the promising black hat practices. If at first everything goes well, suddenly you could lose everything and trying to recover will not always be possible, especially in cases where you do not know where to start identifying the problem. Years have passed since the topic of duplicate content has generated a series of myths in the SEO community, which still confuse many beginners, but also experts. Basically, a content is said to be duplicated when it appears several times on different URLs of blogs, e-commerce, or other sites. You must be wondering why it is a problem, and to answer this question, I'll show various solutions. Search Engines Google does not know which page version should be included in the index or which version should be shown to users in the search results. Webmasters at link building level, some webmaster may link content to unofficial sources, causing a loss of important backlinks. Plagiarism. An attacker could force the indexing of his copy of others' content before Google visits the official version, taking advantage of the efforts of the real owner. About 29% of the web, according to Raven Tools, contains duplicate content. In recent years, Google has warned webmasters on this topic. For example, with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA, tool, the real owner can request the removal of all copied pages from the search engine index. To debunk some myths, Google does not officially penalize duplicate content because it now has various ways to recognize it, but takes action instead when it verifies that someone uses it to deliberately try to manipulate search results or to perform other activities of this type. Where are duplicate contents? Equivalent URLs. Some CMS can generate different URLs for the same content. For example, .com slash article dash one question mark p equals true and .com slash article dash one question mark p equals false. Versions of the site. If you have a separate version of the site that runs on HTTP or HTTPS, www or without www, it can happen that various URLs are generated for the same content. Content theft. Many people still copy and publish other people's articles. What are the solutions to these situations? Canonicalization. In the section head of all duplicate pages, enter link href equals official page, rel equals canonical, to indicate to Google which is the official version. Redirect. Use a 301 redirect to send anyone who visits a duplicate page to the correct one. This practice also applies to HTTP versus HTTPS and WWW versus non-WWW. No index. Use meta robots with a no index attribute on duplicate pages to prevent them from being indexed. To find out who is copying you, you can use services like copyscape.com or manually search Google for a phrase in quotation marks and then contact the webmaster to ask to remove the page. In my opinion, Google Sandbox has always been, or at least since 2004, a very interesting topic because it explains why a new site is not able to get strong positions, despite excellent SEO work, without any mistakes. Although it is an unofficial filter, I personally find its presence in most of my new projects. Google Sandbox is not intended as a real specific algorithm, and Google has always denied it, but as a set of conditions that generate this effect. Unfortunately, it does not have a precise duration, 
but I can say that its effects vary from a couple of months, in the best cases, to over seven months. The reason for this phase is understandable, because it allows new sites to have time to gain authority through content and relationships with other sites in the same niche, without being rewarded too easily. This avoids that spammers and aggressive marketers, with very little effort, get positions and visibility that they would not deserve, overcoming authoritative competitors who have been working in the industry for years. If there is nothing to object about this point, it must be also considered that a beginner, not seeing interesting results after a few months, could easily become discouraged and give up on continuing the project, bypassing, according to the most malignant, to launch PPC campaigns and increasing Big G's income. Here is an example of my recent financial site. You can see a significant increase in traffic after four months from launch, despite the fact that no link building or content publication activity has been done. In my experience, I believe that the main factors that determine the presence or absence of the sandbox are Niche. Some sectors are more sensitive, because they are easy targets for aggressive marketers or spammers, for example, make money online, or because they deal with sensitive topics, for example, medicine. Aggressiveness. If you insert banner ads, call to action, and push a lot on monetization from day one. Poor content. A blog with a few short articles and little content is unlikely to be considered immediately. Quality of links. Do not limit yourself to only having links from social networks, but also look for authoritative sources with the use of guest blogging or other link building methods. As you may have noticed, these are all features common to spammers too, and this is the main reason why Google leaves new sites in a limbo for a few months. In the meantime, Big G will be able to collect metrics on the user experience to verify legitimate projects before offering excellent positions to the analyzed website. To summarize, if your site doesn't get results in the first six months of life, it could just be a problem with Google Sandbox. You can't do much, but just wait and persevere with SEO activities without getting discouraged. On the other hand, I believe there is always a limit, and if after a year of work you don't see anything yet, or you are very discouraged, there may be other factors, for example, too competitive a niche, which should make us desist from continuing the project. This approach of mine is often opposed by those who believe in, if I do things right, I will certainly be rewarded. With experience, we then realize that reality is very different. We are not at school where commitment is rewarded. And from a business perspective, you have to consider the time and money invested. Now we will talk about a very interesting and controversial topic. We can almost define it as a taboo. Negative SEO consists of a series of actions of black hat or similar things made for the purpose of worsening the positioning of another site, a direct competitor, on search engines. I believe it is an act of responsibility on my part not to spread too many details on these practices, which sometimes are also effective, but which may have legal implications. On the other hand, I would still like to treat the subject to warn everyone of the existence of these techniques, which in most cases are performed incorrectly, not causing repercussions on the positioning of the site. Google has implemented countermeasures in its algorithm to avoid being fooled by unscrupulous SEO experts. To list the most common activities in this field, just think of creation of numerous spam backlinks from low-quality sites or with malicious anchor text, copying your content from other sites, removing the current backlinks of a competitor by persuading the sources to remove them, hacking with malware or de-indexing the competitor's site. Now you might be wondering, what can be done to prevent these activities? First, you should monitor your Google Search Console account to promptly take action if Big G notifies you about malware content or manual actions against your website properties. Then, periodically focus on monitoring of backlinks and keyword rankings, because it is essential to discover any significant changes, such as an increase of 1,000 backlinks in a month or the loss of 10 positions on dozens of keywords. If you want to inform Big G to ignore some really bad quality backlinks because you think they can damage your reputation, then there is a special tool called the Disavow tool. 
which allows you to load a list of domains to be excluded by specifying a reason. I created on getseofix.com slash negative dash SEO a generator tool to get a file to upload your list of exclusions to Google without worrying about the correct format. Despite being essential in serious cases, in 95% of situations, in my opinion, the disavow tool should not be used because it could do more harm than good, especially for beginners. For the plagiarism topic, as we have already seen, you could use copyscape.com and check who published parts of your articles in order to request their immediate removal, or send a DMCA report, copyright infringement notification, to Google. For local SEO, instead, there is the problem of fake negative reviews written to damage your reputation and make you lose positions. You could file a report for Google and even take legal action against the authors of the false messages. At this point, we should talk about security, but it would open up endless scenarios. It is certainly important to verify that the site is always reachable, for example, by using the tool that I created for this very purpose on getseofix.com slash uptime dash monitor. Some hackers, on the other hand, prefer to make you believe that everything is going well, but insert malicious content hidden in the pages, which you will perhaps notice in a year or maybe never. Another practice is the insertion of MetaRobot's noindex in the head section of all pages, which will result in the de-indexation of the entire site. To defend against attacks of this type, in addition to using a firewall on the hosting, WAF, and other various security measures, you could periodically verify the indexing of the site by using the query search site, sitename.com. You will see the total number of pages in Google's index and any content you do not recognize. In 2013, I did a job for a client's company website, and I immediately realized using this research that although it was a 10-page corporate portal, in reality it had thousands of indexed articles. Investigating in depth, I discovered that an entire subfolder with thousands of pages full of pornographic content had been uploaded to the server with the sole purpose of deliberately damaging the reputation of the company, compromising any SEO efforts. If you were to find yourself in the same situation, the first thing to do is to try and analyze the IP addresses in the log file and try to identify those responsible, ex-employees or competitors, with the help of police to then take legal action, considering that this is a real crime with concrete damages. After this overview, you know that the attack methods are multiple, and for each situation there are more or less complex solutions. Although it can be a real problem, when you hear victims of negative SEO, very often these turn out to be the problems caused by inattentive or too aggressive campaigns conducted by the webmaster themselves. The term black hat derives from the Western films in which there were the good people who wore a white hat, white hat, while the counterpart was represented by the bad or black hat. Nowadays, this term is used to refer to hackers and other people who abuse software to gain unethical advantages. There is also an alternative between the two terms, called gray hat. In my opinion, gray hat is always black, even if you don't want to admit it. Talking about SEO, Black Hat includes a series of activities which, if, or better, when, will be detected by Google, will result in penalties or de-indexations of the site because they are contrary to the guidelines. In most cases, Black Hat's actions are not illegal and will not have consequences in court, but only on search engine visibility. Now, let's get some clarity immediately. The Black Hat, if done correctly, works and also does so very well. But the problem is another thing. Does it make sense to violate Google's rules to have results today, knowing that in the future we will suffer more or less serious consequences? Although for some people it may be considered a defect, I personally do not like shortcuts, but I have my methods that I have been following for 10 years. Precisely for this reason, doing black hat is not my way and certainly should not be used by legitimate businesses that own a brand to defend. Most of these practices are applied by aggressive affiliate marketers who aim to get traffic quickly and then move on to a new site after only nine months or even earlier.
The most famous black hat tactics that were used effectively until a few years ago were keyword stuffing, cloaking, link schemes, exchanging or purchasing links, duplicate content, and hidden text. Although it still works today, some tweaks are needed now because unlike in the past, these methods are now easily recognizable by the new algorithms. Nowadays, the most updated techniques are discussed on blackhatworld.com and they have to do with negative SEO and the famous private blog networks, PBN, that are a series of blogs belonging to a person who interlinks them with each other using various tricks to avoid being identified as a single person. For example, different IP addresses, absence of footprints, etc. Building a network of sites based on the authority of strong domains that have expired in the past is a quick way to have strong sites and backlinks to push your money site in a very short time. The risk of being caught is really high, and it is precisely for this reason that various services were born to sell links in these special sites created by following the best anonymization practices. Many people also use spam practices through software, such as GSA Search Engine Ranker, to create various levels or tiers of links in order to promote a money site. In short, you should understand that the creativity of Black Hat is really huge and new ways are always ready to deceive the system. But how can you defend yourself from a competitor who uses these methods? My approach is to work on my project and try to do the best I can according to my abilities, not caring too much about who enters and who goes out in an SERP, especially because these sites have a relatively short life and I want to stay away from this world. If you have no alternative, as we have already seen, remember that there is the Spam Report tool offered by Google to report sites that use these practices. It means that a quality rater will view your request and, if verified, he will apply a manual action to the bad site.